this play has all been cast Do not recognize them Do not know the past Wasn't so long ago A different tale was told The ancient script had been rewritten No products are to be sold Yeah, they got to where they want you Yeah, they put a spell on you Scared by these illusions, this new spooky ad campaign. Everywhere you turn, it's always pounding in your brain. Mom, do not go to beaches, do not breathe the ocean air. Yeah, they stole six trillion dollars just to show how much they cares. Yeah, they got you where they want you. Yeah, they put a spell on you. Yeah, da, 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 dee, dee. yeah, they got you where they want you. We're oh, flipping through all them channels, programming mind control. Try to convince the world that the humans got no souls. Yeah, they're only flesh and blood. Yeah, they're only dirt and mud. Our lives conspire to douse the fire, inspire with the breath of life. Yeah, they got you where they want you. Yeah, they put a spell on you. Step marching doctors with their dangling stethoscopes. Their science, they claim the final solution, the only human hope. Or keep you from your neighbors, all muzzled up in the mask. Yeah, you take them off, cause you got no cough, but you don't know who to ask. Yeah, they got you where they want you. Yeah, they put a spell on you. Yeah, absolutely. That's the uh, that's Mike Mattingly, the funky father, playing a song, put a spell on you. Shout out to my boy Mike. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone. My name is Will Keller. Thank you for this uh, this live stream edition, kind of a sporadic moment. But I wanted to share this interview that uh, my good friend Logan Hart from thewizardfactory.com, and I did yesterday on Revolution Radio uh, with Crip Rick. Uh, check out his show. It's titled I've Been Thinking, and that's live uh, Mondays every week. Check that out. Uh, 6 p.m. Eastern for his show. He has fantastic guests on there, great topics. Uh, and you can also find him, his channel on YouTube and, of course, the One Great Work Network, where all three of us are a part of. Check out that that net, network. It's a huge platform, over 75 content creators with the message of true freedom, natural law, objective morality, and ending human slavery. So today, uh, I'm excited. This is a, a crucial time period, right? We are officially in spring spring blessings to everyone i love this time of year this is a time for action to plant the seeds and of course to no surprise the social engineers the parasite class they understand natural law they understand nature how nature operates the energies upon this field and they are definitely taking advantage uh this season the 40-day period uh, from the spring equinox, March 19th, 
all the way to April, I mean, uh, May 1st, May Day. So it's an important time. We've already had some huge events that popped off on the 22nd and today, early this morning, and there's several others. This is not a coincidence. Uh, we're going to talk about some events in this uh, interview right here, and we're also going to talk about the origins of Easter, East Star Sunday. So this is a fantastic interview. I'm going to play it. It's audio, but I do have some slides I'm going to put on the uh, the screen, and then uh, later on we can take some questions and do a little a little discussion after. Uh, so without further ado, thank you all for joining. Appreciate your time and attention, and uh, and let's get to it. All right. Welcome back, everybody. It is, of course, Monday, and you already know that if you're listening in, because I am here every Monday, am I not? At least I have been for a long time, that's for sure. And welcome, everybody. I hope everybody had a great weekend, and I know I did. It was a good one. It was a cold one, but we did get snow during the... Since the last time I spoke with you, we did get a lot of snow, but it is gone again. It is melting, and it is amazing. It was a beautifully warm day today. I always try to give a little weather update, because here the weather is crazy. And I looked up at this guy today, right before I came down here, and I saw them spraying again, so I have no idea what the weather's going to be for tomorrow. It's supposed to get warm here, that's what they're saying, but that could change so quickly. We're supposed to have nice weather in the next few days, it's supposed to warm right up. It was really, really cold, guys, the last few days here, I'm not joking, it was, it was crazy, the weather changes that we're getting. And so, who knows, I'll have to give you guys an update on Thursday. Got some great guests lined up, and this is going to be another great show. As you know, we've been covering a lot of the seasons. And I've had Will Keller on, and I've had Logan Hart on it. We've got into, we've broken down Halloween, we've broken down Valentine's Day, and the origins of it. And I find this super interesting, because I'm truly learning with you guys when I get these gentlemen on, and they start breaking the origins down. I know a little bit, but I don't know the depth that these guys do. So I'm learning with you guys when I bring people on like this. And I'm definitely looking forward to this one. This one, we are going to be getting into Easter, and we're going to be getting into the season of Sacrifice. And I think this is going to be a great show. One, you're going to want to listen to again because this is so important so i'm just going to go ahead and welcome my first i got will on the line so i'm going to welcome you will will welcome back to the show my friend thanks brother thanks for having me on absolutely be here oh i know it's gonna be a good one i'm very excited um as you could probably tell i find i learned so much from you guys when you guys come on you and logan i'm definitely gonna be getting logan on here in like two seconds i'm just giving him a one minute heads up that i'm gonna be calling him and um this is going to be a good one, Will. What do you think? Like, I mean, I wanted to do St. Patrick's Day, but I get it. I kind of blew it. That's my fault. I kind of booked wrong. And so I did. It would, I get why we're kind of not getting into that one, but we got Easter. We got the season of sacrifice. It's just as important. And we can hit St. Patrick's Day next year. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, these uh, these holy days are significant. The The knowledge and the awareness is vital. And uh, and then we can we can utilize this because the social engineers are absolutely use, utilizing that this information uh, for you know dark agendas and uh, to advance um, their whole you know agenda. So right. No, I get it. Yeah, and that that's what I find interesting because I always, as you know, because we talk a lot. Um, I I love the origins of things. I like to I I get the symptoms and I get all those things and I I'm done looking at those. I want to get to the root causes of things. Because I think that's that's how you, uh, at least in gardening, when I got to kill a weed, you got to get to the root of it. You can hack away at the top of it all day long. And then two days later, the root's back up and doing its thing. You've got to get to the root. And I, I take that and I think about what's going on in our world. We have to get to the roots of the problem. And I think that, you know, the breaking down these holidays and their meanings and the origins and going deep into it, that's a, at least it's a hack at the root, a, a part of it. Absolutely. 100%, man. <laughs> Awareness Again, reveals choice, like my yep. brother Logan Hart has stated in the past, um, and that means obviously, if higher, oh, higher consciousness is the goal. Consciousness is pattern recognition, so we are increasing our pattern recognition. That means we need to increase the knowledge, the information, correct information, which is knowledge, and it applies to the world. Yeah, I agree. Are you with us, Logan? I'm here. Oh, Logan. Logan. Awesome. Awesome. I'm so glad that I got you both back on here. I was saying that, well, just at the start, and I was letting people know, like, this is such a, 
I'm learning with the people as I as I hear you guys break down the origins of a lot of these holidays. I I know a little bit. I've looked into them a little bit, but you guys really break them down right from this like the origins, and I find it just as fascinating and valuable to learn this like everyone that's listening. So I I always look forward to these shows when we I get you guys on to break this down because I do as I was saying to Will I think there's a lot of great knowledge here and understanding where things come from. And what I think of Easter, that's always been one. I don't like. I I think I think I said that to you on both uh, last ones that we did on the origins of Halloween and Valentine's Day. Like I just, I, it amazes me how we get from the or, the root of it, the origin of it, to where we have it now. And Easter is one of those ones too. Where I'm like, how did we get to the origins of this to where we are now? So, if you guys want, either one of you wants to take over and break this down from the origins, I'm I'm all ears. Yeah, this has been a really fun and enlightening and fascinating uh series and uh, that it's kind of materialized that started you know with a single episode i believe it was halloween mm -hmm. and it was so powerful you know we we just kept going with it and it's really shaping up to be something awesome so i'm glad to be a part of it uh thanks for having me back onto the show i'm not sure what i missed so far we're right at the start we're Perfect. just we're diving in right at the beginning yeah, it's just, it's so funny to think about, well, not funny, it's it's actually pretty, pretty tragic, but uh, what has happened to our connection to our ancient past, to our animistic roots as human beings, as indigenous peoples of Earth, you know, and much like, symbolically, the Christians would destroy old temples and build their Christian structures directly on top of the old site that is exactly what they have done with our holidays as well instead of inventing their own stuff they simply hijack and pervert and distort that which is sacred that which did originally come from something pure and natural and divine so right. this is no exception you know mm -hmm. Very, yeah, and, and you're so right when I think about that, that how they, it seems to be the, the, the way evil is, is that, and they, they it does, you said it perfect, Logan, that they pervert it, they kind of like hijack it, and I've, I've learned that over many years now, is that they, it never seems to create anything new, it takes something that's good and pure, and it just twists it, it, it morphs it into something that it's not, and, and uh, I kind of see that as these holidays, is like you were just breaking down, like they, it's just amazing what they do. Um, what are your thoughts on this, Will? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. We need to understand this is ancient. Um, the social engineers, the mindset that they hold, it, it's, a re, it's a religion, but it's ancient as well. And it is, um, it's like a virus. So instead of creating something new, that it wants to latch on and feed and distort. Mm -hmm. It's all about distorting uh, perception of reality, inverting uh, what is nature, truth. Uh, and it, this has taken many shapes and forms throughout the, you know, the millennia. And uh, this is where we get, you know, the, the cultural religions from. Um, this is kind of their output, their rhetoric. So every every cultural religion, um, it stems from the animist pagan uh, worldview. So it, it it was a taking and then a twisting of, um, and in many cases, uh, you know, there was a it, there was um, violations and force and genocide involved, especially mm -hmm. with something like uh, Christianity and Islam and Judaism. You know, we're we're still seeing that this is still an active. Um, a state of mind and a sure. active state of duress and violation. So, of course, just like with anything, uh, knowledge is the potential of empowerment, and this is what we need to do. So, you know, shout out to the viewers that can actually truly listen to these types of episodes without their, uh, their, their, you know, their generational programming and conditioning take hold. Because there's a lot of people, especially right now, it's extremely active that the cultural religious programming is coming out, people get uncomfortable and they start squirming and they get reactive and they, and they, they're not even receptive to information. Um, right. So, yep. 
Yeah, but that's very true. Like I, I've learned that with these discussions. Like there is certain discussions, uh, Will and Logan, that they really trigger people, and religion is a big one. And I find that too is that they're not even like most people are not even open to the discussion. I'm open to any discussion, even if I don't know a lot about it. I'm still willing to sit and listen, and I'm really want to listen if I don't know a lot and learn and have questions. And I'm very open to it. But a lot of people are, it's, it was kind of shocking to me in a way, because I've always been that way. And a lot of people aren't, especially with religion and I found politics. Those are the two that I'm just like, wow, people are so reactive and they just shut down. They won't even listen. And I'm just like, geez, like, you think you'd want to at least listen to form an opinion or have, you know, more information to me is always better the way I see it. Yeah, definitely. The, so many great points uh, being made right off the bat. I love this. Um <laughs> I love what you said, Will, about uh, the the human or the the virus, you know, plaguing, uh, and and it's stemming back to the that the kind of the Christian mindset. Um, this this idea popped into my head when you said that viruses don't create; they replicate. Mm -hmm. right. They have no natural creativity; they just latch on, like you said, and and um, exploit and kind of uh, corrupt that, but. The um the other thing too that I wanted to mention was the um the uh, the the attachment that people have to these traditions. We touched on this a little bit in the last one, I believe it was the Valentine right. Day one, where it's like it's no wonder people get so upset and triggered because this is something that goes all the way back in their life to childhood when they were in their formative years. They're the most impressionable, and they have these extremely deep, visceral ties to the memories and the traditions and the feelings around that, that it becomes so ingrained in people. And it's like if you say something challenging these traditions, it's like you might as well be, you know, slapping their, their childhood memories right in the face. You know what I mean? Great point. And, and they, I think it's by, by design, there's always these colors and sounds and um uh, smells and feelings that are attached to these memories and these experiences i think that that's done very intentionally to 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 bury those roots deep down into the psyche and make them way harder to to uh you know pull out that makes sense that makes a lot of sense i'm just thinking about what you're saying logan and i, and I think of any of these holidays in your your extreme, you're so right. That's I think you're nailed it a hundred percent. Is that there's these emotions attached to it, and even because we're going to be talking about Easter, I think of back when I was younger. That Easter, when I was a little kid, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners was a big thing in my at least in my house. It was like my mom made and dad my dad made a big production out of it. Like the Easter Bunny was coming, and they would hide stuff all over the house, and I would wake up and go hunt for it and stuff like that. And I those memories come back as soon as i was we, i was thinking about this whole topic that we were going to be covering that's where my mind went to that it was these memories is right where my memory went to when i thought about easter exactly. like, oh my god all these great things when i was a kid and we were making eggs with my mom and I, like it's it's really clever what they do what they're doing to me i've always that's why i respect for what they're these social engineers they're not they're so tuned into the psyche of the mind and how we react to things that's why right. we're up against something very sinister yeah and intelligent off oh. and look yeah. it's it's important to to keep in mind you know you can still have those memories and they can still mean something to you this doesn't have to negate that completely mm -hmm. but we have to always be willing to to respect right to take a look again that's what that word means to look again at the things that we believe, the things that we kind of assume as truth or take for granted as just that's how it is. That's just what we do, you know, and I mean, you can you can even have the knowledge of where things came from and still choose to participate if you want to. That's the beauty of of awareness and free will. You know, the awareness creates the choice. You can change or you you can continue, but at least you understand what it is you're celebrating, where it came from, and then make that decision from a place of from of gnosis and awareness instead of just accepting, you know, just kind of blindly uh, the status quo. Right. Great points. What do you What do you think? Well, I think this is so cool. What we're diving into here, I'm really going to enjoy this. And 
I that did you do you have the was your family like that with the whole hiding of the eggs and that or am I one of the weird ones? <laughs> no, my parents have. Uh, I was raised obviously on a ranch of you know ten acres, uh, very close to nature, and my parents were not religious at all. Even though my dad, you know, he was he went to Catholic school for a little bit. My birth mom, uh, in her later years all the way to death you know she considered herself a christian but um was very open minded <clears throat> one of my biggest actually supporters was was her uh when i was coming into my journey of higher awareness uh but growing up these holidays were literally just a reason to get together and mess around on the ranch oh cool so awesome. it was a, it, it was a gathering time um and that's that's strictly what it was, and that was usually for all holidays, an excuse to to get together. That's awesome in a way. Like I mean, and I just, I think that's cool. Like if you can get together with family, and anything that brings people together is in that kind of way is amazing to me. And I think we need more of that now, probably more, a lot more than we have. I oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think it's great. I mean, the, the gatherings, the celebrations are excellent. Um, I use you know reverent, but again, there's these layers of kind of um illusion and delusion that are over these these time periods so you know for you to have that gnosis means you understand where your currency your energy is being invested into mm -hmm. so this is something that right. the social engineers do especially in this time period is one of the biggest they are manipulate manipulating people's energy to go a certain direction for them to unconsciously invest into an endeavor, right? That's yes. not paying so-called dividends back. So it's it's uh it's just paying it's paying division, not dividend. Um so having that awareness and understanding that these quote unquote holy days are actually rooted in nature, in objective reality, in truth, in the cycles of nature, in energy and consciousness and are very personal uh, personal to all life as well so having that getting down to that root for me and logan agrees i'm sure that's true spirituality yep. it's all about relationship your your relationship to yourself to truth to moral principles to nature uh and to reality and how we interact during this this experience 100%. journey yeah that's amazing. Yeah, go ahead. If you want to add in, Logan, go ahead. Just chime right in, man. I'm good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm excited for this. Um, in my mind is already trying to go a hundred different directions. Me too. I'm trying to kind of keep it on a leash and make sure that we sort of try to go through this in a more structured uh, fashion. So I agree. Yeah, I have so many questions, but maybe we should get to the let's let's bring it right back to the origin. Let's. I think that's the best place. Let's build this foundation. Yeah. Let's get back to the origins of Easter. Like what, skip the colored eggs, the chocolate, the bunnies, all of this <laughs> stuff. I want to get right to the root of where this celebration comes from. That's where I want to start. Yeah, I, I can uh, I can kick things off with that. Awesome. Sweet. Great. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, the most simple, direct thing that I think you know, can encapsulate what the what the true meaning of the origins of this holiday is, is a celebration of the vernal equinox, right? The rebirth of the sun, the return of spring, uh, and moving out of winter into spring, the, the sun is uh, reborn and moving back into the, you know, the, the full, the northern hemisphere, and uh, the days are getting longer and all this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, like like any good pagan, you know, the the people, especially of uh, European descent, this is really where this particular um, thing came out of uh, directly. But I'm sure that this is obviously something that uh, was celebrated and recognized all over the world. But the thing to keep in mind is the the seasonality of the different regions of Earth. So even within Europe, uh, you know, the people in Southern Europe were celebrate or were having this celebration sooner than, say, right. Scandinavian people because spring came earlier than, right. you know. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, that's the, that's the kind of the base layer of it. And then you have all these different goddesses and holidays that were associated with those that were, you know, a, a traditional of these different uh, people and their cultures. So that's where the syncretism comes in that we kind of revisit again and again on these on these episodes of the syncretism of truth. When something's based in nature, it's universal and you might have a different name for it than me and maybe a, even a slightly different interpretation of it. But we're talking about the same thing because it is inherent to the shared reality and the f natural forces that we are all experiencing as as human beings. So, um, very cool. Mm, yeah, very cool. It, it always comes down to nature, which is really amazing. That's what I love. It always seems to have it the, it, the roots. It comes from nature, and I that's what I I really connect with. And before I get your thoughts on it, will I? I there is hope because my neighbor. I was talking to my neighbor Terry, who's listening in right now. He's beside me, and I was telling him what we're going to be diving into. Uh, tonight and he broke down basically what you said logan like he was he, he like as soon as i said like the origins of easter he was like he basically was saying what you were saying he's like oh it has to do with the you know the spring and the seasons and like basically what you said i was like okay so there is people out there that have some knowledge it was really cool that he broke it down like that and and had at least understanding of where it came from and that's yeah, really I think, cool i think people even have kind of an intuitive knowing even if they haven't like directly looked into it I think mm -hmm. people just kind of have a general, it, almost instinctual or intuitive uh, understanding of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so to those people, I think this information should resonate because it's kind of confirming what they already sort of know, but then giving them a little bit more actual information behind that and hopefully some some useful mindsets and perspectives about it as well. Right. Yeah, it, it's true. It does resonate, uh, at least for me. I mean, I, it definitely does. It. You can feel things and I definitely can. I'm more definitely more in tune than I was even five years ago uh, to the, the nature. Like, the, I, don't, I don't know how to word it, like the rhythm of the earth, I guess. Like, I, I don't know, for lack of better terminology, that's how I feel things now. And I can feel these changes and you can feel it coming and um, you kind of get in the sync with it. Like you kind of get into the ebb and flow of it, which is how I describe it. So uh, it's very interesting Now, when you start doing this work, you start to come back to it and, and connect with it again, because I think they do their best to keep us so separated from nature. And it, that's what I noticed now is that people are so disconnected from nature. It's, uh, I always say they're like soul sick. I, I, that's the only phrase that ever resonates with me when I say it is that society's soul sick and I, and I think it's this disconnect so i'm I'm going off on a tangent i'm sorry will want to get your thoughts on on what logan was saying and what we're talking about the origins here yeah and brick that's a great word disconnect i i use that often because that's exactly what it is that you know it's really not about learning something new it's it's more about remembering uh like so we have been disconnected and we need to remember or relearn this information um, that's, you know, kind of inherent in reality. I mean, if you think about our ancient ancestors, as, you know, as long as men drew breath, they looked up at the, the heavens, the stars, they gave respect and celebration to the sun and the moon, which you could look at as the masculine and the feminine and the earth as well, right? The mother, the great mother that sustains all life. So th these are commonalities that have always existed in some form or fashion, and celebrations and rituals have changed throughout the years. Um, you know, something to kind of note that <clears throat> we're going to talk about the origins of Easter, but it's and it's directly related to the spring equinox, where this is the sun moving from winter into spring. So the equinox means equal, equal day and night. So the sun's at the zero degrees equator and rising. So it's leaving Pisces and going into Aries. Um, and many ancient cultures celebrated the spring equinox this time. I mean, the ancient Egyptians had, um, and again, I'm, I could be pronunciating this wrong. It was Sham el Nathim, which was the beginning. It's a celebration for the beginning of spring. The Greeks had a festival of Dionysia. Um, and the Romans had their holiday as well. The Persians had one, uh, which actually the Persians celebrated New Year's at the spring equinox. I personally consider the new year to be the spring equinox, the natural new year. 
Some people disagree and uh, they say it's in winter uh, when, you know, when the sun breaks that uh, that degree and, Drew. you know, the 23.5 degree uh, tropic and then is moving from that. So rising creates a cycle. I think life to life, life, death, life, that's a full cycle in my book. Yes. I, I want to add to that, dude. Go for it. Jump I, you in. Are, you're on point with this. This is what is directly telling you whether you're celebrating a death cult or a, a, pr a practice of life, right? Yep. So the Christian perspective on um, the Christmas holiday followed directly by New Year is putting all the emphasis on death, the celebration of of I mean, you know, they they talk about well, he was only dead three days, and but it's it's all about the focus is on the death, not about the rebirth necessarily. And then you know, the, the even seasonally, the it's the death of the sun, right? And the but but it, life begins at life, right? When you're born, you don't start dead, and then your you know your life begins when you're alive when you become alive and that's what spring is all about when when life returns to nature so i mean yeah it's a very interesting way to look at that it really it, is yeah actually to add to that logan uh another thing is you know where you know christ was dead for three days and that's at you know he dies at on the cross that three days is the three houses, so you can look at it as the three-month period to the spring equinox where he is risen again, right? Uh, Easter. That's interesting because it's three suns is three days, and then three moons is three months or moons. You know what I mean? That's yep, the, exactly. The, the, the correspondence aspect there, yeah. Yeah, and Easter is always... You know the the sun day, the sun day, yes. uh, after the fir the first moon in the the lunar month. Right. So, um, you know, same with Passover is during that time as well. So uh, there's there's so many correlations that that go with this, and we can go on and on. Uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating. I could add a little bit to that uh, right away as well as. Um... As you were saying, there's there's all these different uh, iterations um, for for basically the same thing, even though they might not have been exactly the, at the same time. But uh, you have, I think, one of the oldest um, of these fertility goddess was Ishtar or Inanna of the Sumerian uh, right. culture, and then you have Ostra or e Eostra, which was the Anglo-Saxon spring goddess. And then you had the May Queen, which was English and Celtic, you know, celebrating May Day. Um, the Slavs, the Greeks, and then, of course, the Norse. So they had Stigerblot, which means literally victory, uh, ritual or sacrificial offering. So Stiger means victory or success. And Blot is a word, the Germanic word for a sacrifice or offering. Um, and then, you know, they had Oster, Ostra, and Ostara. Those were different uh, variations of the same spring goddess as well, um, who was the bringer of light after winter and happened to often be depicted as a hare or a rabbit. And oh. what I wanted to point out, though, here is East or Ost is the Germanic word for East. So you have Ostara, you know, Ostra, and Easter. So there's the correspondence yet again of the East in many traditions symbolizes renewal, rebirth, and the start of a new day. But remember, you know, that there's that macro, microcosmic correspondence of the days and the months and the seasons. It's all the same thing, just how big of a cycle are you talking about? So the east representing a new day because the sun rises in the east. It's the return of light, which is the same as what's being represented with this spring, you know, the vernal equinox. Yep. Wow, that's fascinating. The season of life. You know, we yeah. um, con we consider in, in our modern age that there's four seasons. And the ancients absolutely, so it, it, was, it looked at as two seasons. 
the season of life and the season of death. Obviously, the season of death is, you know, fall and winter. Mm -hmm. And then the season of life is spring and summer. Um, and this can be easily observed, right? When you look at the season of life and you have the beginning of spring, the snow has melted. You know, the plant life is is starting to bloom. Uh, the mm -hmm. soil is fertile to yep. plant seeds. The animals are coming out and mating, et cetera. There's, there's more there's more light. Yeah. Um, and this is where you, you grow your crops, then you harvest in the summer, and then you, you know, you're stockpiling and preparing for the season of death for fall and winter. Um, wow. so in this modern age, it, you know, it, it's something that can be looked over just because we have modern technology. I mean, winter can just be another day. It just might rain or snow, but still, you know, you're going to work. You're going to school. We're, we're not as affected as our ancestors were yeah. uh, during these time periods where everything, survival, life, depended on the knowledge of nature, the season yeah. of life. and the Yeah, you had to know it or you, you died. Like, I, you're so right. And so I would think that what we're speaking about Easter, spring and all that, this must have been the most important time of year for all around the world at this time of year because it would dictate um it would dictate your whole year right like i, I understand how important that this time of year is this, this season is the, the, yeah the seeds you're speaking. planting you're, the seeds you're planting now and this is this is both, so important this is both literally you know it's for agriculture and you remember like before the modern age and the the industrial era and all of these kind of things People, especially animistic, you know, pagan people, their whole life revolved around agriculture. It was both their way of surviving and their actual vocation for the most part. There were other people, but most people were farmers, at least to some capacity. And because, you know, it was a group effort. And, and so that's why all of their big holidays were so that their whole lives were centered around the cycles of agriculture. Yep. For, for you know in, in every aspect but also always remembering to look at it in the correspondence levels of you know mental mental and spiritual so the the thoughts that you're thinking the information that you're taking in the skills that you're learning right now and the things that you might be building in life right getting getting ready to start a new business or launch some new program or whatever it may be uh those are planting seeds as well so you're that now is the time where the the ether is is fertile the you know the um the soil of reality is ripe for planting and uh gestating into something very productive you don't want to plant when it's fall right you're not yep. going to you got to get any uh, return on your investment so it's you know we've talked about this as we were as we've uh, talked about, you know, Halloween and it, it's kind of that's the other end. We're kind of at the other end of the, the sphere now of like instead of harvest, now is the time to plant. We just made it through winter. We have we took the time to be still, to look within, to kind of rest and digest and contemplate and think about what you have learned and what you uh, want for the next cycle. And now it's time to start taking action because, again, there it's fertile grounds. What you're going to do now is going to have the max return uh, by taking action, and that's what nature does. Nature rewards actions. That's amazing. Like that is so. Like I'm, I'm really. That's so cool what you're saying, and I'm thinking about what you're saying, Logan, about this moment. What stuck out to me is your mo a moment of rest, and I think about how the world is now and how people are now. There is no rest. Like, people are just, who has time, let's be honest, who really in time, the way that the society is structured now, who has time to sit back and just describe what you did, rest, contemplate, think things over, take that time, you know, you've done the work during the, the, the spring and the summer, and now you have this moment of rest, which I think is so important, it's as important as the, the other part, of, the other aspect of it, but people have a lot, they it we've been disconnected from so much is what I'm trying to say, and rest is one of them. I, I'm I we're being bombarded. I don't think people have a moment to even rest at all. And I just like so I'm kind of going off again, but I just this is where my mind's going as you guys are talking. It's like wow, like people just don't have time 
to even sit, sit and do any self-reflection anymore. And then, and then you lose something huge, I think, that, you know, our ancient, you know, our, our ancestors had. It was so much more in tune with right. the rhythm. Integrated and synchronized with the rhythms right. of nature. That's what it's all about. And that is what has definitely been lost in modern society. This is, that, and that's yeah. not good. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> you know, s something that's profound is that we can we can observe and learn from the the macrocosm. So you know, the larger bodies of nature, the stars, the moon, the sun, and it all correlates to the self, to the individual. Meaning that the sun itself, the S U N, is the soul of the world, right? And it's also and its whole journey, the the yearly journey. That's what it is. It's an adventure. It's a it's a journey. It's a hero's journey going through the the constellations, going through death, and then coming back around and coming out of the tomb of winter and being you know and 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 rising again to life. It's the same thing as an individual soul the journey that we are on we are born we are here for self discovery to learn to grow and evolve our soul and then we we die but obviously that is not end right mm -hmm. it, it is transmuted and and transferred again so winter being the the time period of regeneration and internal aspects just as the sun goes through the uh the winter the darkness right and then it comes out like this is what the spring is all about it's all about um it's like it's just like a day right a year is just like a day for the individual you are awake you're doing things during the uh, during the day and then what you go home you lay down and you go to sleep to what to regenerate yep. then you wake up again bam it's that's spring the fr it's the fractal fractal nature of reality. It's the Russian doll. Everything just a smaller or bigger iteration of the. Everything is the same in a different way. That's exactly. Kind of with that, yeah, yeah. Correspondence as above, so below; as within, so without. And the ancients knew this. They were they were extremely versed in in this gnosis. And of course, they. How do you how do you convey this knowledge? to your to the children and then to so it's passed down through generations and generations stories stories, stories. Yep. exactly everything was oral tradition you this is why we can see uh even the cultural religions today there's the um the anthropomorphic uh you know the it, it's it, nature is given human characteristics this is so it's relatable and it gives <laughs> it a story and it's easy to remember it's easy to pass down and um and yeah but of course you know when you write things down and you're passing knowledge that way it can be easily misinterpreted and sure. and uh and manipulated as well for sure, sure. no wow. so this is the difference of truly understanding like you know the topics that we're talking about and seeing it in your life in reality Versus just reading it and taking it for face value or page value as you read it. And this is the problem with all of the cultural religions or any of the religions, right? This is the exoteric versus the ex the esoteric. You're taking it for face value. And this is, the, is what most people know. Or you actually understand the metaphors, the allegories, and the message that is concealed within there. The reason. Uh -huh. Right, right. Wow, you're so, you're so right. I'm I'm thinking about that too. That that's how things are passed down. You're right. Stories and written down. And I've I've talked extensively about how things, if they're written down, can be manipulated and changed over time. And I I get into some good our discussions. I should say about that one too, which is kind of fascinating. That people don't even think that in certain cases that you know words don't they stay true all the way through history. And I'm like I don't think so. Um, it's so, easy to lie when you write something down, yeah, yeah. right? It's exactly. easy to lie when you type something on social media. It's a lot harder to lie when you're standing face to face to someone. Right, you're right. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And I'm just, I'm keeping it. I'm definitely keeping track on time because I know I want to get uh, in the second hour, like this whole season of sacrifice, and because I want to cover both aspects, the origins, and then what it's been turned into, and what it means to the dark, 
you know, the dark occultists, because as we were saying at the beginning, this is what they do. They they take something that's pure and they they you know, they infect it is a great way. Like it's like a, this parasitic virus or something that that they right. put into things and twist it. And so but what I wanted to ask, because I did have a friend ask me this and they wanted me to ask. Now we're talking about spring and we all know it in the in the spring there was a lot of animal sacrificing going on and stuff like that. They wanted me to ask, what was the reason for this? Like, that was their question. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, we have to understand that <clears throat> from the from our ancestor perspective, that that blood itself, just like Logan talked about earlier with nature, there's a, there's a give and a receive, right? So there's there's this relationship of giving and receiving, and in the ancient times, yes, there were animal sacrifices. This was an offering. This was a sacrifice, which the word sacrifice, all it means is to to offer something sacred. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what? and when you think about the human body itself and the the energy that flows through us, this correlates to the blood itself, right? The heart space, the, the, the generator of energy and you know the heart has the largest magnetic field as well in the body larger than the brain itself it is the pump and it pumps the blood the 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 inner chi the energy through our blood so you know the ancients considered blood itself as being sacred containing the energy of of something so this life was a great force. life force energy and this was a great offering so yes, they would spill. They would do animal sacrifices, and they would put the blood into the earth itself as an right. offering, trying to uh, you know influence the energies, giving to receive. Yeah, great, well said. And I'd like to add to that. Uh, how much longer would you have before the break? We got. Uh, let me just check. We got about nine minutes, ten minutes. So we're good. Okay, cool. So it's on the hour then. Yeah, about three minutes too. So at uh, five fifty-seven, or sorry, six fifty-seven, we take about a three-minute break, four-minute break. Got it. Okay. So yeah, um, yeah. What Will said was definitely on point, and I also just want to add to that that it first of all, blood sacrifices were not the only type of sacrifice. They were probably the highest because it, it they they did respect life, and it it, it meant something. This wasn't trivial. But it was also about the value of animals that they that they had. Like animals were were life in and of themselves to be able to have like livestock, for example. You know, the very first rune is Fehu, which is where the concept of money or the the fee comes from. They didn't. The Germanic people did not have money. They they had and they traded cattle like currency. This is where the word fee comes from. Is Fehu. And so th- that will give you an insight into the value that they had of their animals. So it's not about just killing the animal. It's about giving something, offering something to the gods or the, the spirits of nature, something that's valuable to them. It's showing I'm willing to give up something that's valuable to me to receive something valuable from you. So it could have been an animal. It could have been grains or, be, you know, mead or alcohol or, you know, uh, some other kind of, mm-hmm. you know. Seeds, other... I would think seeds is a big one. Seeds, to me, is a part. It would be important for growing to have a, a abundance of seeds. <laughs> yeah, just any, anything that was valuable yeah. to them. Jewelry, right? Something uh, handcrafted uh, or a sword or something like that. Like these were the things that they would uh, sacrifice. It wasn't always just animals, but animals were typically reserved for the most sacred of uh, rituals and uh, ceremonies like these uh, th- these type of um, holidays that we're talking about. So that is when they would uh who would offer animal sacrifices because it's like if if we don't get our planting season right we're all gonna die so this is uh really important so they wanted to bring the the highest level of magic and the highest caliber of of sacrifice to ensure that they would get good good favor from the gods basically 
Wow. That makes so much sense, Logan, that what you're saying, like, because I think, and I, and that's good that you kind of bring this up because it, I think that's a really important point when we're talking about the animal sacrifice and, and you, I think you nailed it when you said this is that, you know, these animals were valuable. Um, like I, like back in these times, I think, you know, animals were probably not cheap, not easy to come by. And, you know, they, they were so important. So I get it. It makes total sense. The way you break it down is that, you know, I think people just think they, they were just slaughtering animals just for the, for the heck of it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But when you put the value behind it of, of what these animals were worth, this was so, like you said, valuable. Because I think it was probably, like I said, not cheap to have animals. And the more that you had, like, it just, I think people can figure out what I'm saying is that, you know, they were th this value. So I get that. And um, it makes it total sense. With, it was done with great respect and reverence. Right. Right. It's it's very contrary to this idea of, of just these, like, violent savages and, you know, that, that the uh, modern religious or academic people want to portray the ancient or uh pagan people as right yeah that that's important i think that people don't realize what you said i i think that's really breaks it down and i was and I, it kind of ties into what i was watching the movie dances with wolves the last night and i love that movie just because um the connect for native americans the connection to nature i've always found that fascinating that they were so in tune with nature um and they that's kind of like part of the movie was that they were you know I, I think everybody's seen the movie but he wanted to marry the one the one woman and he had to give offerings so what what was he offering he was offering horses offering like jewelry everything that you said this was this was their currency and right. so like the more ponies the guy the and one native elders like you're gonna need a lot of ponies to, to get you know the blessing to, to marry this woman so he had to keep bringing ponies <laughs> to the yeah the cheap kind of thing and i'm like so it just makes sense what you're saying that this was their their form of currency and animals would be one of the highest yeah D germanic people didn't care for money even when romans and things would offer them you know coins or some jeweled goblet Gen or something yeah. yeah they would be like oh that's shiny and they just <laughs> put it on the shelf and they just go right back to using what's practical right they were very very practical people well, yeah, that, that brings up a good point of what is intrinsic value, right? What is real intrinsic value, which intrinsic means of nature, from nature, and it can be used, right? So um, that's something to, to take into consideration. Also, I want to say something about the, the sacrifice. It's, and, and, you know, people that have, you know, cultural, religious conditioning and backgrounds, they, they kind of want to, they want to put... Um, what we're saying in a certain box, like we are advocating for animal sacrifice for, as we're talking about that. And I, we're not doing that. We're taught, we're, we're educating. We're talking about what the ancestors, what was um, their mindset? What was, yeah, exactly. Mm. What was their mindset and, and the science behind it? And this is important for when we get into to, uh, the second hour, when we talk about, you know, the season of sacrifice and the social engineers. Because they very much, like I said earlier, in the old, you know, the old ways, the old religion, they very much believe in bloodletting and and using blood as as a um a a propagator uh, for energy. But every single person that exists now sacrifices every mm -hmm. day of their life. Sacrifice is giving some, giving up, giving up something sacred. And what is more sacred than your energy itself? Mm -hmm. So when we think about our ancestors and they, you know, they valued, they valued animals, they valued blood itself. That might not apply today. We have a, we have a greater awareness and understanding that actual energy and what we do to, to operate in reality has great value, our time and our attention. That's so powerful. You're right. And I've yeah. been saying that a lot more too, Will. I've been saying that a lot more, like lately more than I used to, is that you, you, when you do realize it, like what exactly what you said, what are the two, I think of two things that are so valuable. I'm like, what is, so, for each person, what is so valuable? And you're right, ener your energy. And for me, it's time because it's so limited. Like we're not here very long. So I just think of how many people, currencies. It is. It really is. And how many people waste their energy on time on nonsense like right. just and i just think like 
if they really sat down and thought about what we're saying, they would maybe direct their energy to something more productive, more positive, more healing. I don't, that, I just really, it discourages me sometimes when I see the energy people pour into certain things. Yeah. And to add to that real quick too, cause I know we're about to go to break. Um, but like Will said, everyone is doing it. The question is, are you conscious of it? Right. And are you, are you doing it with true discernment and wisdom? It's a lot like magic. Everyone's practicing in magic, whether they know it or not, but the ones that don't know it, they probably suck at it. And they're either not able to manifest what they what they want, or their magic's being hijacked, and they're they're manifesting for someone else who is hacking into their creative power. And in that same way, the sacrifice is being hijacked. So people who don't understand the value of sacrifice, they're going through life trying to either do the very bare minimum, and they're entitled little children who are who are expecting to win the lottery or get some kind of, you know, great reward for not putting in any kind of work, or they're sacrificing all of their true spiritual currencies towards things that don't uh, actually bring them any kind of ROI and are serving someone else that they probably don't know even exists, and uh, they're just being leashed the hell out by some kind of social engineer or dark magician of some kind. Right. That's going to be a great way to wrap up this hour, Logan, and bring in the second hour after this break, guys. And I maybe during this break, think about what we said uh, and take just a few minutes to think to yourself, where where is your energy being directed to? Like, what, where is your energy going and what are you sacrificing energy-wise? And where is it, like, I just keep thinking that, where is your energy being diverted to? I think that's a great way to end the first hour and, Please stick around, guys, because we will have Will Keller and Logan Hart back second hour in like three or four minutes right after break. We're going to be getting into the origins of Easter and the season of sacrifice. Stick around, guys. Welcome back, everybody. It is Crip Ricks. I've been thinking, and we are in the second hour. It was an amazing first hour. I'm glad you guys stuck around. I have two incredible guests on, Will Keller and Logan Hart. We're continuing the series where we break down the origins of holidays that we all recognize, we all know. We've already done Halloween, we've done Valentine's Day, and now, of course, we're going to be ta we're talking about Easter. And the first hour was amazing. We really got into the origins and where it all started. But the second hour, I would love for you guys, wherever you guys want to start this, because I do know, as we were saying in the first hour, guys, that things get corrupted and being and twisted. And I definitely know that that is what has been going on, and we can get into the season of sacrifice. So wherever you want to. Maybe, Will, if you want to start it off, where do you want to take this? But I definitely want to get into this whole season of sacrifice because, you know, we we talked about the good origins of it, but what does it become is what I'd like to get into for this hour. Uh, before we get into that, do you sure. think we could just briefly uh, get into the Easter egg part? Because we haven't really got to that yet. Oh, yeah, my neighbor was, it's funny you said that, Logan, because he, he broke it down. I, I want to see if he's right because he broke down. He goes, where did Easter eggs come from? And I was like, I, I don't know. And so I wonder, <laughs> it's going to be interesting if he was right. <laughs> Logan, go ahead, jump it off, brother. <laughs> sure, sure. Gladly. Um, so generally speaking, the egg is associated in ancient traditions with rebirth, renewal, fertility, right? Um, and then the, as I mentioned before, the uh, Ostara goddess was often depicted as a hare. And also in G Germanic mythology as well, um, the goddess was uh, w was healing a wounded bird before turning it into um, into a rabbit, and then the rabbit was still partially a bird. Uh, it showed its gratitude by laying eggs as gifts. So that's kind of like the mythological origins of, but between you know the connecting the the Germanic mythos with this idea of the rabbit and uh, laying eggs or get offering eggs as gifts, right? Also, it's kind of a weird, yeah, kind of a weird story. And then in ancient Egypt, the egg was found to symbolize the sun, going back to Ishtar uh, as well, who is one and the same with, uh, with the Sumerian um, Inanna. And uh, so there's, you know, as we've talked about before, there's that crossover, multiple... Um, multicultural we could right. say uh origins there and then just briefly and this is just according to history which we all know about history and 
uh, the the potential fallacy of of those who um, have been the writers of history. But according to history, uh, in the 1200s, King Edward decorated eggs and handed them out as gifts. So this was kind of I'm painting the picture of the development of this idea into the modern tradition. Okay, it went from the you know the bird uh, turning to a rabbit and laying eggs as gifts. And then we take that, and then you've got the king decorating eggs, handing them out as gifts. And then in the 1500s, Martin Luther uh, allegedly hosted the very first Easter egg hunt for his congregation. So that's that's kind of the stepwise progression into the modern day thing. Which, and uh, I wanted to just throw out there: this is hilarious that this is a theme on every single one of these that we've done so far where we go from something extremely deep and rich Mm -hmm. and and meaningful to basically a consumerist tradition of buying plastic and sugar. Yep. We're in that a break. (laughs) Yep, you're right. Yeah. And and I even kind of thought of that of like the cheapening of that of in via correspondence. So you're you're you've got plastic decor and just cheap trash to to decorate out externally right and then you're taking nutrient void toxic candy internally into your body so it's just poison all around you know and of course what does plastic do poisons the earth the whole you know the 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 origin of venerating earth and its natural cycles into something that's literally poisoning the earth and ourselves all right how's that for irony that's what I mean. They, 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 it's like you guys both said at the first hour. They, this is what they do. They, they poison anything that's pure, and that, that's so. What's the? It's so. It gets me so angry. Is like you were. You broke that down perfect, Logan. Like you look at the origins and how, how amazing the, and it's such an amazing story in history of what you guys talked about the first hour. Like I would love somebody to break this down to me as a young kid more than the newer version that you just broke down, which is to me, I just, it's laughable now to see where it started to what it's become. I agree with you. Like it's, there's nothing resembling. It's all consumerism. Now they just, mm. that's, that's all they focus on and see. And you're right. That is the theme of the, all of these shows is that what have they done? They've twisted it into something it was never meant to be. And then they commercialize it and people lose total connection with what it even, where it even came from. I wonder how many people even know what we're speaking about the origins of these you know, it's it's become so meaningless, right? Right. There is no education in the wisdom that these traditions are supposed to be teaching. It's 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 been uh, reduced to a performative, you know, ritual basically, where it's there's no meaning behind it, but people are still going through the motions. They do the Easter egg hunts. They go to Easter Sunday, you know, and they they like they pimp out. Like I've always noticed that, like people that don't even go to church, they they buy these super nice fancy shoot, you know, suits and shiny shoes, and they're all pimped out just so they can go kind of flex on people at Easter Sunday at church. Yeah. Wow. And we, we, I want you to weigh on this, Will. This is some good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, look, <laughs> you're nailing it. Uh, no, I find it interesting. Well, first, the egg itself as a symbol and what it represents, it's actually um, it's one of the most powerful symbols, right? The egg also represents the universe, the cosmic egg, right? Where the, the egg itself is the universe and in the middle you have the the yolk, the golden sun with the, the living water around it, mm-hmm. right? Uh, uh, encapsulating it which can also represent the ether as well the ether is kind of considered like a plasma mm-hmm. uh, soul and, yep and exactly and the soul yep the sun the soul so and also for the individual right it's it's feminine it's it you can look at it as the womb with with the the soul inside the womb the the child fire and water uh, yep fire fire and water exactly um, and of course, you know, when when an egg cracks from the inside, obviously it's life cracks from the outside. It's death. So the just the material is um, the materialism that's involved uh, in all of these these holidays, mm-hmm. right, especially Easter uh, and the inversion of it. 
There's also the the polarization. You know, I find it interesting that every, almost every holiday, there is an invisible delusion that is attached to it, right? With Easter, it's the Easter bunny is going to, if you're good, is going to, you know, give you a basket of, of candy or gift or something like that. Yep. Same with Christmas, um, St. Patrick's Day as well, right? The invisible leprechaun leaves candy and coins and that kind of stuff. So it, it almost kind of um, it, uh, promoting the uh, the um, the savior effect as well, the polarization. On one end, you're believing in um, in fantasy that is not real, uh, and and then you know when you find that out, that could th- absolutely you know as a, as a young kid or a teenager can throw you into the opposite polarity of it's all BS and none of it's real, and you know could be the seed that is planted for either you to be an extreme religionist or an extreme atheist. Right. They right. they don't want people on the middle path of gnosis of knowledge. That's what they don't want. They want people polarized. Um, so that was I was just kind of relating that to children and the the upbringing and the programming that that's attached to it as well. Mm-hmm. For a lot of kids, when they find out the Easter Bunny isn't real. Right. It, it it's in some kids, it creates a trauma response. Right. To have this belief shattered without explanation or or whatever so it's um it, it could definitely do some some damage that, that's Again. a good question well i don't mean to cut you off but i, no, I go for it. want to ask you this and it's kind of i don't want to side word too much but because you brought up the easter bunny now you know when you know, there is a point where children find out that santa claus is a real leopard like you name it easter bunny all of this stuff because you're a, a parent and i and i'm really curious about this do you think that these traditions that as we're speaking of like Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, that do they do more do you think they do more damage than good, or is there a healthy way to do this? Well, I think there's absolutely a healthy way to do it. Um, and that's kinda I think our goal when we do these episodes is to get, is to uh to point parents in the right direction of knowledge and understanding so they can they can apply that in their in the the parental relationship with their children. Um, for instance, my daughter uh, she likes these holidays. It's it's more of a fun thing to mess around with. Mm-hmm. But I absolutely explain to her um, and educate her on what these days are. I mean, she doesn't believe there's someone coming down the chimney, the, the chimney. She doesn't right. believe there's a rabbit, you know, going to people's houses and leaving candy and that kind of stuff. And, you know, not not every every holiday. But, uh, I, you know, for instance, um the equinox, it, we do a celebration. We do a celebration, and we're outside all day. We're going on a hike, um, and cool. you know we're we are we're grateful. Our whole presence in the day is venerating and grateful for this time of the season. Mm. That's incredible. Well, I'm glad yeah. you answered that because I was just curious. The only thing I want to add to you about before we get back in Easter is that the one thing that always the one thing tradition that is weird to me is the tooth fairy thing. I always think like what twisted. Where did this come? I don't even know where this came from, but it is messed up, man. That you leave teeth under your pillow and somebody comes and gives you money. I always that would creep me out, man. I'm like, this is some weird person thought this thing up to me. It's just a weird one, but anyways, <laughs> the tooth fairies always freak me out. That's the whole story. <laughs> yeah, it it just goes to show the the literal the literalist mindset of the West and of Christian cultures. Um, yeah, you know, they do the same thing with the, interpreting the Bible and Jesus and all these things. They take it very literally, and so it's like, well, yeah, the, their children are are taught to be- believe literally that Santa Claus is real, the Easter Bunny is real, and then it becomes a traumatic experience when right. it, they they find out it's not. Uh, be- instead of teaching them what you know what it might represent, and like you said, Will, you know you can choose to celebrate it, it as long as you have understanding of it, and then you don't lie to the kids. That's the part that's messed up. Yeah, just tell them it, it's it's a it's make believe and it's just for fun, and that's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Just don't don't lie to them and let them actually believe that it's literally true, and then they'll have that that traumatic experience. But exactly. It, Circling back to the egg as well, um, I, I love that you brought up the cosmic egg because that is one of the most important um, aspects to understand. Like it, it, it's an, a, a deeply occulted symbol that is extremely profound and important. It is the seed 
or, or egg of of life you know like the the egg and the seed are the same thing it's just of the plant and the animal kingdom because it's it's a round shape right that's feminine that contains all the potentiality of what that being will can grow into being right but then it's the env environment the nurture the care that that thing receives that determines how it turns out how healthy and strong it is and all these kind of things right so all the potential potentiality uh is contained within that seed or within that egg and then it's up to the gestation and the care uh that that it receives that will determine the actual outcome playing out and that is circling right back down to what is this tradition all about planting seeds no right the seed mm -hmm. is the egg uh that will will hatch and grow into your creative output throughout the year and that you will eventually be able to harvest the benefits of to to reap what you sow right this is just it's it of sowing it's natural law cause and effect mm -hmm. right so you sow now and then you reap the harvest later that's incredible. And that's so powerful what you're saying, Logan. Like, and I hope people really hear what you're saying. And you and Will are both saying that, you know, what you're, how it echoes. Like, when you're talking about nature, it always seems to come back to the individual and what's going on inside the individual. And then how, because we you know, are like there. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what people have lost, I think. At least the people I talk, a lot of people I observe and talk to, that's the, the disconnect right there. They, they've, they've severed that connection. As we spoke about in the first hour, and then and it seems like this is where we have to kind of rediscover, as Will said, we, we have to rediscover uh, all of our origins and and things that we've forgotten, and then that they've made they purposely have steered us away from. It's really, I keep saying it's so evil what they've done, and but genius in the same. Like I and I hope people understand what I mean when I say that. Like you have to respect what they're doing because they're they're masters at what they're doing. Just look what they're doing to humanity as a whole. You know, this kind of struck me just real quick, too, of of this disconnect with nature that you're talking about is how most people know they they have one of two mindsets about nature and themselves. They either tend to see nature as perfect and good and whole and wholesome and humanity as corrupt and vile and evil and wicked and all these things, or, you know, nature is wild and pure chaos and humans are what bring order and and civility to earth and all this kind of thing those are both dialectics all of that is Boy. contained within nature and ourselves that's the pure potentiality it's learning condition versus nature right that which can and cannot be changed human beings can be good or evil and nature can both be harsh and nurturing you're so right yeah that's the way that's you're right that's the way i've always looked at nature logan is it, it's 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 amazing and beautiful but it's it's got its harsh component it's to it brutal, I mean, too. it's yeah. very brutal i know and i just know by observing the animals out in the yard all summer that nature is very un, like unforgiving is the best way i look at it. like that's what i think of when i see an animal that's struggling or you know it, it, nature has its way and it, you're right it's beautiful i see beauty around me all the time when i want to nature i try to spend so much time connecting to nature again and being out you know just in it and but you do see there's a there is a you're right there is a brutal part to it very much so and it echoes in people i think people are the same like you said um people have both elements in them that that's the dance that i think people have to that that's what we're trying to balance is a good way to put it Yep, absolutely. Thing. Wow. What do you think, Will? I'm going to get your thoughts here because I know when I, I, I just look at the time and I wish I had another hour half to, like, anytime I talk to you guys, it's like, yeah, oh, I wish I had another hour because we just yeah. started getting the good stuff at the last hour, it seems. Good thing we didn't try to do St. Patty's Day. Oh, my God, you were right. <laughs> I thank you for that advice because I did, guys. I wanted to do St. Patty's Day and Easter. And I'm thank yeah. God I said we don't have time for both. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. So, I mean, and we, we definitely should get into the season of sacrifice. It's extremely right, relevant during this time. And, you know, it, it's good 
I'll kind of set the stage real quick. It's good to understand what the sun itself actually represents. The sun represents the light of, of the creator. It represents knowledge, right? Knowledge of nature, the soul, natural law. So when we talk about the social engineers, right, and how this this parasitical cult, they they still believe and act on the old ways, the old religion. They are a solar cult, but what they represent, they represent the like the black sun. So it's mm-hmm. the inverted light of the sun, right? Not the light of the creator. It's it's the the dark the dark knowledge. So when we look at occultism and it, we understand that it is the knowledge of natural law, how reality operates and how the human being operates, right? This vast critical knowledge and but how it can be used is another story. Someone can use it for light or dark, right? And, and obviously the social engineers use this for their own um own advantages um, and, and to give humanity the disadvantages, right? I mean, they've been referred to as the cult of the black sun. Yeah. Um, so during during this time period that we, you know, we've set the stage for the season of sacrifices, it's a fertile time energetically. We're planting the seed and um, and we're we're having those offerings of our intention and our intent to act. And planting those seeds for our energy, so we can we can put in motion what we will harvest, what we will reap later on. And the the energy is high, the energy is fertile, and this is a a prime time uh, for you know psychological operations, false flags um, to disrupt the energy and the rhythm of life and the flow in the population to influence. Um, people to give up their to sacrifice their own energy for their cause, and of course the, the the this this cult believing in the old ways they very much believe that this offering needs to be in blood, mm-hmm. and planting wow. planting their seeds their dark seeds of of chaos uh, ignorance you know yep. suffering. This is what they want because they can use that. They they are alchemists in their own ways. And that's what's important is this is simply the corruption of the polarity principle of nature. Nature is not good or evil. It just is what right. it is. Yeah. And so these people, they understand that, that every light has its dark side and that they can exploit and utilize that negative expression of anything, right? Like, you know, uh, beautiful lovemaking or an act of rape. It's right. the same action, but there's a light and a dark aspect to it. So just like these holidays, they are tapping into the charge of g- these events, these natural events and these uh, energetic seasons. This is that time where, like Will said, the energy is fertile. So, of course, they're going to do the same thing. It's just what seeds are they planting? Is it for goodness and creation and abundance and prosperity? No, it's the opposite because that's their agenda is to perpetuate the lockdown on consciousness and perpetuate the mind control slave matrix, essentially. So that they're doing the same thing as the pagans were. It's just what are are they bringing about? What harvest are they trying to bring out? And what seeds are they planting? Right. And I just I just want to really, you know, drive this home for the people listening is that there's all this negative stigma about the Illuminati and they it's all pagan like witchcraft and don't demonize that because all that is is nature. They are abusing nature. It don't demonize the nature for how they are abusing it. That is the worst mistake that you could make. Understand where it comes from. Understand the sacred dynamics that they are exploiting. And don't throw out the baby with the bathwater by thinking that just because they're doing it uh, in this way that everything about it must be evil. 
You've got to understand this stuff. Don't come from a place of ignorance and just rejecting what you don't understand. That's why we're here on this show talking about this, to show like you can understand what's happening behind it and, and see, be, have that discernment of, of the light versus the dark aspects and expressions. That was so, wow. That was so well said for Logan that I made sure I, I was like, I'm not even going to make a sound because that is a sound clip. Like that is a, that's a clip. And <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm not even saying a word until he gets it all out because that was perfectly said. Well, Thank you. Wow. Amazing. What do you think, Will? Yep. Yeah. I, I want to, wow. I want to absolutely concur with what Logan said. And I want to put an emphasis on it because I think this is one of the biggest issues in the quote unquote truth movement. And it's easy to spot by the way they talk about either paganism or occultism, or they say the issue is the Lum Illuminati. When the Illuminati itself, it was a group um, that took that term, which that term by definition means enlightened ones, the ones with the light, the light mm -hmm. of knowledge. And they are not that. The social engineers are not the enlightened ones, right? We're talking about the cult of the black sun we're talking about it's a death cult it is the opposite of that but this is what they do they invert and they pervert and they manipulate so they take a word like that and then they they utilize it so everyone thinks it's the illuminati with and which they're speaking from ignorance because just by the definition they aren't using it right same thing with occultism itself occultism is just simply knowledge it all depends how you wield and use that knowledge. Yeah. So this is and there is a reason why the cultural religions demonize and say, don't look into occultism. Don't look into paganism. Paganism is bad. Animism, etc. Tarot, all this kind of stuff. They don't want you to have the knowledge because they want to be the arbiter of their reason and of of their knowledge that they're propagating. So that's extremely important, and I want to put the emphasis on it. Same thing with Freemasonry. Everyone another thinks, oh, it's yep. the Freemasons. Yep. It's the Freemasons. No, you are absolutely, completely ignorant. Freemasonry is knowledge. It's a pathway of gnosis. That's what it is, and it has just like, just like all of these traditions and all of these pathways, there is light and dark depending on what you utilize it four so yeah. that that's what it is these I, I don't identify as freemasons they don't identify as anything they they i mean they don't it's a cult without the name what they identify what they don't what they want and what they propagate is control violence and death that's what they are yeah. they're parasites i completely agree with that and also i'd love to to even add on further here that you to to understand the nuance of this, first, you need to be able to differentiate the philosophy and the knowledge versus the lodge system or the the uh, religious institutions built around that, right? Mm -hmm. So when you say Freema Freemasons, uh, are you talking about anyone who studies Freemasonry and, and, you know, takes in that knowledge and lives by it? Or are you talking about people that are involved, especially at the higher levels of the lodge system, that would be a more accurate uh, idea when you're talking about, oh, it's the, you know, who's, who's doing this? Who's the problem? First of all, the, the agenda and its network is far bigger than any single institution. They have people in every aspect of occultism, healthcare, education media it's it's a network that goes all the way all aspects of human life mm -hmm. so even within that a sphere of occultism it's not just the jesuits it's not just freemasons it's not any any one of those but sure you could say that higher levels of those uh institutions are part of uh, their players on the field of this agenda that would mm -hmm. be accurate but but to demonize the knowledge of occultism because of that is, yep. is a huge fallacy and a huge mistake. So that's the first thing. Yep. The other thing is, see if I can remember the point that I was going to make. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's like, 
you have to understand that knowledge is a tool and it is neutral until it is applied through action. So it's it would be the exact same as if you if if someone made an observation that okay every totalitarian regime in history that has oppressed people and cre- and committed genocides right they all carried guns that means guns are bad wrong huge huge fallacy mm-hmm. right it's the abuse of that tool and and actually if everyone was armed with knowledge and could use it to defend themselves, then these small little gangs that happen to also have guns would be inconsequential because the majority of people would be armed. And that is the problem, is the majority of people are not armed with knowledge. It's just the same disparity of most people don't carry guns around, and the police and military, they're ones with the guns, and they're the ones, lo and behold, that are doing all the actual oppressing of people. It's yep. the exact same thing. It's it's the perfect analogy, in my opinion. You uh, can't demonize guns because bad people use them. It's the same argument. So what we need is everyone taking in knowledge, arming themselves, so that they they level the playing field. Yeah, I I can't. I'm so glad you you both brought this up. I really am. Because it's sometimes I find myself getting into the pretty intense discussions about some of the information I've looked into. I over the over the years I've looked into Satanism. I read the Satan, Satanic Bible, and I had people really crawl up my ass to be honest and give me a hard time and like, oh my god, it's going to corrupt you. And I I'm like you both of you guys. I'm like I'm just taking in knowledge. To me, more knowledge is better. It's what I do with the knowledge that I'm taking in is what makes it good or evil. But people have a hard time. Like, you guys are breaking down, figure, like, seem to figure this out. Like, they, they, and I, that, this is one of the biggest things that really get to me, gets to me when I get into these discussions with people, is that they really don't see that knowledge is not, it's not the knowledge that's bad. It's how you apply it and how you use it and internalize it and then express it. And this gets overlooked by, by people because I've got, like I said, in some good, heated discussions by some of the stuff I've looked into because they believe that it's going to corrupt you or something. And I'm just like, real, like it's, it's really weird how people think that, but it, it's yeah. fascinating in a way too. But I, it just drives me crazy. Like when I get into that kind of debate. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. You guys brought up excellent point. Wow. Yeah. So you, the, you know, the season of sacrifice, what, what, when is that, right? This is a 40 day period from, you know, March 22nd to, May 1st, May Day, these, you know, 40 days. So you, you have, you know, a biblical and, and a True. cult uh, representation as well. Mm-hmm. Now, there's, they, the social engineers love to do their blood rituals uh, in this time period. And they, you know, they favor, um, you know, March 21st, 22nd. Um, they favor that time period because that's kind of like the jumping off point. It's the beginning of the season. So there's, you know, and there's a list that we can we can talk about some of these, uh, you know, Waco. Um, uh, that was April 19th. Um, the Boston fire was March 20th. Keep in mind that three days before March 22nd, it's considered in, you know, in a dark occultism, it's the preparation time. So e- even in the lodge system, there is, you know, there's rituals that they do. They fast as well. Mm-hmm. There's the preparation to engage the energy, to engage the ritual sacrifice. So they consider those three days part of the season as well. Right. Interesting. Um, so there's all these dates. Uh, I mean, the Fort Hood shooting that was uh, april 2nd um uh the iraq war the the shock and awe bombings that was march 19th uh lockdown in the united states march 22nd 2020 um the red lake senior high school shooting um march 21st just recently this year right we had the moscow concert hall mass shooting right march 22nd you're right first days day of the season three days ago exactly skull and bones all day. types of 
322. Yep, that's exactly what I was going to go to. The Skull and Bones, 322. So the, the Skull and Bones, Skull and Bones Day, is re, it's re, uh, referred to the, it's the clandestine lodge, uh, you know, dark Freemasonry, the Lodge 322, which is the Order of Skull and Bones, uh, a.k.a. the Order of Death. And this is a Yale University-based order, right? And it, it's headquartered. It's headquartered at the university, and it's called the location is called the tomb. So this is reference to uh, 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 Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff, and it's symbol um, symbolic for Freemasonry and the third degree tracing board. But you know, you have like the Bush family, the Clintons, Obama, all these people that are, uh, you know, from the Yale University. This order. Three, two, two. It's interesting because you have you have the head and then you have the bones, the head representing, you know, thought, the bones representing the body. Yeah, exactly. Intellect and then the body itself. But you're missing the heart. You're missing emotions. Right. Okay. So skull and bones. You're missing the care. So it's yeah. very fascinating that the mm. you know during this season there there are these events that create this shock and awe that create this disruption and it's all about you know managing perception and managing energy and focus. Yeah, I mean if you if you actually tallied up uh, a comprehensive list of all of these sort of uh, shootings and massacres and this and that that have happened within this window, it would be absolutely staggering. I mean, I don't know if anyone's compiled it completely, but I mean, you could just take a, a you know, a swatch of it and, and you, you've got dozens of names, but I mean, it would be probably in the hundreds at least. Oh yeah. Of all of these major yeah. things. And so think about what that is doing. The mind control system is based and run on trauma. It's trauma-based mind control. So again, I ask, what are the seeds that they are planting? They're planting the trauma that they can use to harvest people's energy. That is how they control people. They traumatize them. They demoralize them. Then they offer them false programs and constructs that they trauma bond with that they latch onto as a part of their identity who they think they are and how they think the world is that is a projection of their unhealed pain yeah. and wounding that's what that's what they are planting so it's it's the beginning of the process so think about the perversion and the and just the the defilement of the sacredness of of what that means a season that's supposed to be all about life and fertility and growth and and just abundance and prosperity then you've got these these massacres blood you know bloodshed like think about what that is you know is doing it's it's just the total perversion of that no absolutely absolutely I, and that uh, will you just send me that season the sacrifice list i did put that in the chat for everybody to have a look at and um, yeah, there's a lot of dates here, and I and I remember Logan. I did see a documentary a long time ago where somebody broke down a list of the dates and what it's like when these all events fall into, and it was like it scrolled for like three pages. It was crazy. Yeah, this when they the compile it is is just a handful. I mean, that is oh, yeah, there's nothing there's compelling telling to the whole to tell. You know that's just an example, but something going on here with energy manipulation and stuff it, it, this it was this was what me and my neighbor were talking about right before we got live before we came live on the show here and we were kind of talking about it and what what i what and i i don't know how to ask this question to make it make sense in, in spoken but we were kind of tossing back like are these like cuz he was like okay like there's so many of these events going on during this this time of uh, the season, right? Like that we're speaking about that season of sacrifice. Um, and it's individual people doing it. Now, I guess my question would be, because we were like, is that coincidence? Which I don't think it is, but are they, is the energy being steered to make them do this? Do you know what I mean by my question? Like, yeah. How, how are they people in all the fear? Right. The key, it, it's to keep people in a state of fear when this time period is, is a time of focus and action. That's what it is. Yeah, I can't. We create positive change. 
Okay, I get what you're saying because I don't think it's coincidence. Like, so confusion. Said, like, yeah, yeah, confusion. Like, why? Why is this happening? And most people aren't even putting those pieces together. That like, not only is why is this happening, but why is this happening always at the same time of year as well? True. But that that speaks to the nature of the enemy that we are dealing with. The people that that have the capacity, both morally and influentially to actually make this happen consistently for years and years and years. I mean, probably hundreds of years, I would say at least, um, you know, but this list just goes back a few decades, but it's been going on way longer than that as well. What does that tell you about the, the organization and the resolve and the follow through of these people that multi-generational, they're they're maintaining this tradition. They're unified and focused. Exactly. Unified yep. in, in their agenda and their mindset. 100%, man. 100%. I mean, you can you can see what's going on right now. Anyone that, you know, you know, claims to be aware <clears throat> about what is going on. There's so much fear propagated during this time, especially this year. Because, you know, today we had there was a lunar eclipse. You got the solar eclipse on the 8th. And and it's it's all about perception management for behavior control. You can look at the season of sacrifice. It's a perfect representation of you reap what you sow. So what are we sowing right now? Because we are going to reap that. And that's a great, point. you know, in in months to come. And they they like Logan said, they want to they want to create the trauma create the trauma now and then they're going to get the control later on wow yeah and i, I just kind of giggled there will uh, if you heard me giggle though it's just because when you said the lunar eclipse my uh terry my friend here he was like this is a lot to do with the lunar like lunar cycle and stuff and it, you said it right when he said it to me so i was just <laughs> like god you guys are on the same page right now <laughs> yeah well you know the the social engineers they they are they have a profound understanding of this information, of this knowledge, mm -hmm. and they of, utilize of it. nature. Of nature, exactly. Uh, you know, the knowledge of astrology as well. So they understand these natural energies, these cycles, um, the time when it is fertile to plant a dark seed, and they, they act on that. They act on that. So I think that the point of having this awareness is not to be in fear. It's to understand, have that awareness and and act itself. I've called called this time period the season of sovereignty. I like the season of sacrifice as well, because that question comes up. Of, well, what are you sacrificing and for what? That's what we Boy. need to understand. Right. Sacrificing for fear for them or for sovereignty, freedom. Mm -hmm. Truth and morality and action right. for change. Sacrifice your own blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. So that you can reap your your the, the you know the the fruits of your own labors instead of being a slave. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's so powerful that you I'm so glad that you guys brought up the even just talking about sacrifice, because I think as soon as people hear that, they go right immediately to what we were covering earlier. But you make a great point that we're still always sacrificing. I think that gets lost. People don't really think about it that way. But th we're always in this constant state of sacrifice. That I think that's so powerful. I've never heard that spoken out loud like that before, like like that. So I think that's really interesting. Now you got me thinking, like, you know, I, I've been thinking about, like I said earlier, about time and our energy. So I've, I'm aware of it. But hearing it spoke out loud like that is kind of interesting. That it makes it really brings it to the forefront like when you think about that you are sacrificing at all times it just makes you really think i mean i love that's what i like it's yeah like well thinking i mean how, how do you how do you know if you're under mind control you observe your triggers absolutely so when you say a word like sacrifice and and someone immediately goes to oh gosh pagan animal sacrificing yep. in the woods this kind of stuff right that's i mean they panic that's yep. panic. Exactly. That's mind control. <laughs> right there. <laughs> <man. laughs> You're right. Exactly. Those, those triggers to me have always been 
such so powerful, especially when you become aware of them, because we all have them. And either you're aware of them and you're or you're not. And when you become aware of them and you start to to know what like to be really aware of them, it's as you learn a lot about yourself, at least I have about these triggers and and I, we all have them i know we do and you're right like oh i can say a word to somebody and you can see the trigger there's no thought going into it they did it's, it's a reaction and it's so quick like you'll bring up satanism and then the, there's no thought into like really anything about it except what they've heard somewhere and they jump right to it and i think reaction. people have to yeah this reaction and this is how i see humanity in the state we're in now is this reactive state where there's not really a lot of conscious thought going into anything. They, they are so masterful. They have people in this reactive fear state. That's what I, that's the best way I can describe it. This fear reactive state. That's where humanity's at. And I'm so glad that we're trying to show people that and educate people on that and how to get out of that. Because this, that's the key to me is getting people out of this state. That is the trauma. That is the yep. evidence for the trauma. Because again, it all trauma is the fuel, the gasoline in the gas tank of the whole slave matrix system. Good point. So, yeah. you know, people are basically trying to walk on eggshells now because everything is so triggering and people yep. are just ready, just waiting for you to miss up so they can jump down your throat with mm -hmm. their virtue signaling and whatever have you. But it's it, it's all a projection because the issue lies within them. Right. It's why community comedians are getting canceled because you can't even joke about stuff anymore. People are that reactive. That says a lot about mm -hmm. where people are at mentally, you know, that like you can't take a joke that, you know, what does that say? If, if, if you know, you like tease somebody about something and then they can't take a joke, it shows there's there's hurt under there. And, you know, it's it's OK. It's natural. Right. When when something bad has happened but if you're not dealing with it then that's more your problem than anybody else's and that's the real takeaway here is that nobody's doing any any healing work any shadow work they're not even addressing it or acknowledging it let alone trying to shift out of it so of course they're going to be easily control so easily controlled and manipulated and predictable absolutely great point great point and and that's what i try to talk about so much is the work that it always comes back to the work on yourself any of the major great discussion i've had it always comes back to that this is the step i truly know people are missing is the shadow work that we talk about and getting to know who your authentic true self is and i think that's the step that most people are missing they do they it's and it's, to me it's the most crucial and i'll keep saying that because it's it is that important to me i know how it changed my life and i've seen it change other people's lives and i but that work has to be done and that's the problem is that people won't do the work. And then they're then then no wonder they're so easily led by by the social engineers. I mean, if you don't know have a true knowledge of who you are, then you're you're so programmable. You are a sheep. You can be led anywhere. Yeah. So you know what I mean I I I I hope I said that right, but it, it rings true to me. That, that 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 that's the work that people need to do is the inner work and and then and that's what they're we're lacking you got to call a spade a spade and a sheep a sheep and mm -hmm. you know what's interesting is like even with like that may sound insulting but like it's true <laughs> well beyond just the, ju the beyond just the fact that it's true even more importantly it's changeable this Good goes point. back yeah. to what i was saying earlier of like you know learning the difference between what you can and cannot change it's like if if someone's ignorant about something and i'm like you're a dumbass right it's okay because they can sit there and like well wow i am a dumbass right now but i can just go and, and learn about this and and change that and then i won't be a dumbass anymore and that's your personal responsibility and my personal responsibility it'd be different than being like you know Oh, you have buck teeth or something like, you know, like, oh, wow, great. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, mm -hmm. it's it, it's messed up to make make fun of someone for something they can't change. Yep. But to call them out of, of something they can change, you know, it's like, hey, you're an asshole, you know, and yep. it's like, yeah, you're acting like an asshole, but you can choose to change it just like that and start treating people with respect. And then guess what? You're not an asshole anymore. Great point. 
the knowledge is there that more now i think than ever in history we, we have all this knowledge and wisdom at our fingertips and we can find it if we care enough to look for it and and that's the problem too is that and see that's another whole show how they they and divert people from actually finding this information we're speaking about with all the games and TikTok stuff and all this all this other stuff to distract people. That's a whole new show, but I get what you're saying is that this information is out there if you want to look for it, and you can change it. You don't have to be a sheep or anything. This is all changeable. All of this is, but you have to care enough to want to do it. Exactly. Yep, 100%, man. In the age of information... Uh, the the first stage is understanding the basics, meaning understanding what it means to have teachability, high teachability, to be receptive, right? It's just like just like this time period, the season of sacrifice, the the or the even the the first degree tracing board in Freemasonry, right? When you turn it on its side, and it shows the the zodiacal journey of the sun. Right. You you understanding that symbolism is exactly a correspondence to the self. You you, the internal work. You have to make sure that you are ready to receive, to start that trek or climbing Jacob's ladder. Right. Mm -hmm. To towards the sun, towards the soul. So there's so much information. People are just unconsciously. They're not receptive. They're not fertile for knowledge, for gnosis. They're just taking in, you know, short form content, you know, mm -hmm. million miles an hour. It's just going in, going out, and they're taking whatever they want. But they're not in a place of actual learning and mm -hmm. teachability. So it, it always starts with the self, the internal work to prepare yourself for ju just like gardening. You have to prepare the soil. The soil has to be ready for yep. the seeds to be planted so that they can sprout and bloom. Mm -hmm. And make sure you don't have a bunch of weeds already planted yeah. in your garden. Yeah, I can relate to that because I garden now every every year, and your guys are so right. There's work that's involved to prepare the soil. You like I just don't go throw seeds in my garden at, in the spring. There's a process, and you have to make it right for the seeds, and you have to. There's work, and you're right. Look and get rid of the weeds, and there. But there's preparation and work, and that's. And it just, it ties, once again, with nature, it always ties in beautifully with us. Yeah. When you talk about it, it just comes together like it, it's meant to. It's all yeah. there, man. It's all there. Like all knowledge, all wisdom, it comes from nature. And, and it's the original book of wisdom, right? Great point. I like That's that. right. That's right. The so this season of sacrifice, right? It's uh, the, the 40 days and it ends on May 1st. May day. May Day, May right? Day. which was May. the high holiday of the Nazis as well. Wasn't that like Valshandler? I can't pronounce it. Valpurgisnacht. Uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's the midpoint between spring to summer. Oh, okay. So another big holiday. Yeah, right. Okay, I get it now. I'm trying to remember. I, I've taken in so much, it's hard sometimes to keep it all in. It would let it be midsummer, like right. the movie. Yeah. Oh, right. That's right. Right. Very interesting. Another propaganda piece. <laughs> exactly. That's what I mean. Like they, everything has just been inverted. That that's the and I keep saying it's the genius of their what they're doing. The social engineers. And I've always, you know, you have to respect them. I guess. And I've heard. I actually heard Mark Pascal say that you have to respect them as an adversary because they're so good at what they're they do. I and mean, you just have to right. the weight under eye to that. Yeah, like, and that's what I try to tell people. You have no idea what you're up against. And then they think I'm crazy and I'm a conspiracy theorist and I'm a doom and gloom guy. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just trying to point out that you were up against people that know the psychology of the human, of a human, of the human, like of humanity and of people and what triggers them and all these things. They're masters at it. And they're in it. I, how you can't look out in the world and not see that is beyond me. You have to be willingly blind to not see what how good they are at what they're doing it's masterfully done you gotta be a nazi to not see yeah exactly <laughs> exactly it's incredible yeah like it just, but thank you guys so much once again um for coming on here i i was really looking forward to this one and learned a lot i went and i hope everyone that's listening is taking a lot of great stuff there's some great stuff in this in these this, two hours this might have been my favorite yet yeah 
we're getting good at it, that's for sure. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one for sure. This is going to be a great series. I think a very powerful series that's going to give people a lot of insight. And I'm just checking the time because I want to make sure I give uh, you guys time just to let people know what you go you got going on. I know Will, you've been you're doing your show. You got presentations going on. You're doing you got a lot going on. So can you let people know what anything that you want them to know, anything that you want them to go check out on your site? The floor is yours. We got a few minutes, so I'll give it to you, Will, and then we'll pass it to Logan. We got like four minutes here to to just break it down. Great. Yeah, no, thanks for, for having us back on, Rick. Of course. Uh, I, I love these sessions. The chemistry with us three is fantastic. And uh, so thanks to all the, the listeners for, for tuning in and sacrificing your time and attention to invest. And hopefully you got value. And if you did, uh, you can go to my my personal official website is willkeller.com. And yes, I am doing my live show uh, every other Wednesday. It's a live presentation with open discussion at the end. So people, anyone's free to join, to hop on and share their thoughts um, at the end of these uh, these live shows. So again, uh, you can go to all my social media links as well. And again, it's willkeller.com. Perfect. All awesome. right. And you know, out there, Logan, let people know where they can find all your amazing work. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me and, and Will on your show, Rick. This is always a ton of fun. And yep. again, thanks to the listeners. Hopefully we planted some seeds into fertile ground, you know, to to take to take root. So if you did, again, check out my website, thewizardfactory.com. That is my platform. Uh, mainly focused towards my YouTube channel. So if you want to go subscribe there on the Wizard Factory channel, and you can follow me also on social media. All the links are at my website right up at the top of uh, thewizardfactory.com. So see you there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please check out their sites, guys, and go show some support. They're both doing amazing stuff, amazing work, getting this information out there. I love the fact, too, that, Will, that you do have a live part at the end of your your show like where people can come and just chat and give their opinions on what has been discussed and you're very you know you're very open to anyone coming on and having a discussion they can ask you what they want and that's i think more people need to do that i think that's a I, I encourage it i encourage it absolutely logan logan's definitely a, a regular participant for sure i always yep. appreciate his insight and uh it, it's been real fun a lot of engagement so yeah anyone come on up it can be video or audio that's so cool. Yeah, I love that. And I, it, it's a great thing to do that, people's comments and get their thoughts. So thank you guys once again for doing what you do. I love you guys both. I really do. I've learned so much, and I continue to learn from both of you. And so it's amazing. Thank you, everyone who's taking the time to come and listen. I appreciate each and every one of you. I, you make this all worthwhile doing it. You really do. So thank you guys so much. And I will be back. Thursday, the Griff Rick and Jonathan show, you know, same time, same place. We will be here. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to uh, having a great week and have a happy litter uh, day or whatever you want to call it. And take care, guys. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. What's up, everyone? Bring my brother Logan Hart on the uh, on the studio stage. What's that was up, a, brother? That was a great interview, man. I really love that series. Uh, thanks for everyone that tuned in. Again, that that was a replay. We did that interview yesterday, um, and it's we're going to continue to do these series as well, diving into the origins of the holidays, uh, and uh, it. It just it's great chemistry we flow very nice and they always fly by man what do you think oh yeah yeah uh, it's hilarious that we uh the original plan was to cover saint patrick's he, easter and the season of sacrifice all in that show there ain't no way you know oh, man so, that would yeah, have been, we... been way too much the two hours would have flew by and we would just barely scratch the surface yeah so we reached out to Rick beforehand uh, and and let him know where we were thinking. And so we are going to jump into that next year, you know, the next uh, solar uh, lap around. And uh, we, we have that one left and what Christmas and maybe Thanksgiving. I mean, 
Thanksgiving is maybe not as like pagan oriented, which is kind of what we've been getting into with this series. And I mean, other than that is dumb stuff like president's day. And so, I mean, like we've covered most of the major ones. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually looking forward to Thanksgiving where it's like the official holiday of like gratitude. Right. But coming from, you know, the native American perspective, this is not a, a holiday of gratitude whatsoever. Uh, it's a time period of genocide and theft and violations. So we can get into all that kind of stuff. And obviously native American, uh, you know, ancient culture is rooted in animism. Everyone's culture comes from animism, right? Paganism is instinctual right? for, for everyone. It's just having that information, that knowledge, and then integrating it, right? So animism is the, the worldview. Paganism is integrating that worldview into your daily practice. Exactly. Perfectly said. And it's just absolutely a mind-blowing to me when you think about that, that most people are no longer attached whatsoever to their pagan and animistic uh, roots and traditions. And that goes to show the success of the multi-millennial campaign to uproot people from that, to sever that connection, and to graft on newer mind control programs such as Abrahamism and others uh, as well, but those being the main ones. Yeah, it's fascinating when you kind of really start to dive into just the overarching category of the social engineers, their mindset, what they've been doing for hundreds, thousands of years in its totality thus far. Um, it It's incredible, really. Like they're playing the long game um, and they they know natural law. They know what you know, true control for longevity needs to needs to start within the mind and continue it within the mind. Um, so they're playing that long game. And this is something that even in animism and paganism, I mean, having that connection with nature, knowing that we are a part of it, and it is a part of us. You're obviously thinking about ge the generations to come. You're thinking about your ancestors and you're thinking about the generations to come. And, and, you know, I would say in the modern time, we've lost that even in the so-called truth and freedom movement. You know, I, I know of people that have not started doing the one great work of ending human slavery because they feel that they're not going to see any change in their lifetime. I'm doing this work and I'm sure you can agree regardless because it's the right thing to do. And it's, it's going to take, a, a maybe a slow process of chipping away at it and slowly growing that awareness but and it, it's going to take generations just as the social engineers took hundreds and thousands of years to slowly chip away and violate and and kill and genocide just cultures of the world at a time um to you know to de detach and usurp that animistic mindset and that connection um, it's, it's going to be a long haul process to, to regain that connection, but absolutely doable. And it's really going to come down to an act of will. Um, so absolutely. I, I feel like this is the pinnacle pinnacle of where principle meets pragmatism and, and, you know, acknowledging anything is possible because, it just it's a it's only a choice away if everyone chose freedom it would happen immediately but understanding that the likelihood of that is very low given the current conditions and circumstances that we find ourselves in so yeah like being realistic with where we're at not sugarcoating it but being hopeful as well right finding that balance and Doing it because it's the right thing to do, not necessarily because it's going to have a, an immediate result that we personally get to benefit from it. I mean, the, the way that I look at it very simply is what, like, I have to live with myself, right, and my choices. What, if, if, if I live long enough and, and prosperous and, and have grandchildren, what do I get to tell them? What, what did you do? when all of this was going down and I have to 
face myself in the mirror and and know did I do everything that I could to stand on the right side of history? That's how I I look at it, and that is the main thing that kind of helps keep me going, even when it feels like such a grind. Because, man, I know you know, like it sure does. Sometimes we, we're constantly mm -hmm. fighting against uh, apathetic people, uh, you know, algorithms uh, playing the whole game, trying to make money and survive while while sacrificing arts. I mean, it's you know, it's not easy. That, yeah, you know, we're not we're not blowing sunshine anyone up anyone's ass on this uh, on this matter. It is what it is. But, you know, like it still comes down to choice. Either you choose it or you don't. And it's choose all it or lose you. it. Yeah. Choose it's it or all, lose it's it. all on you. What you decide is on you. Yeah, I, I agree for sure. You know, the, the, the term, the phrase, the one great work um coined by mark passio but inspired by an alchemical hermetic phrase called right. the great work which is what you know magnum opus is one's great work that the internal process of distilling the soul in short becoming a better person right so that's like our our human process and obviously the one great work is the external output of creating change influencing change to make it a better place right so making ourselves better and making the world better because we're obviously in in a in a pretty bad situation and the work itself is is difficult there's a lot of time management uh resources um blood sweat and tears which is sacrifice exactly. and you know it's it's pretty trippy because I mean, when we look at the time period we're in now, it's like, I mean, I just did that live presentation on the 19th and then the next day, or it might've been that day, there was the mosque uh, or the Moscow uh, concert shooting. And then all, and then today, this morning, there was the, the Baltimore bridge thing. So, you know, discussing the vector right how it was done who was involved that's that's speculation you know good luck trying to find you know solid core truth in that um you know but there's not there's no such thing as coincidences right chance is just law not recognized meaning the cause is not recognized so we see this time period and uh you know uh, people in the chat were asking about the the eclipse in april 18th and how you know, there's been sheriffs and a whole bunch of whistleblowers coming out saying that there's been multiple year preparation. You have any thoughts on that, Logan? It's it's quite possible. I mean, at the end of the day, with with these kind of things, they're so macro and uh, kind of unpredictable, right? Just because you think something might happen and you're fully prepared for that, you never know where it's going to happen or how it's going to happen or how you could actually be prepared for that or be, you know, know where not to be at that time or whatever. It's certainly no, no excuse to just, uh, go living in fear as that is always their agenda is to try to, you know, even if it's correct that they're, they're pushing that fear on you. Mm -hmm. But as far as, uh, feasibility, sure. I mean, we just talked about in this episode that you aired here, about how that's what they do. They take these natural events and they bastardize them. They tap into the charge and then they they work their own dark magic into that to bring a specific outcome with their agenda. Exactly. Yep. And that happened the next morning after that interview. It, it, it's, you know, people need to understand that it doesn't have to be artificial. It doesn't have to be manufactured, meaning these events. It can it, it can be a naturally der derived event that they will promote and twist and keep people focused on one dialectic of it or turn it into a dialectic to control people's perception and keep them in, in a state of fear. But hey, you know, there's the level of acceptance that I talk about is not accepting evil. It's accepting that we are externally enslaved. That is that is the, the problem that we can observe. And knowing that, accepting that this is where we are here and now. 
It's like, then what are we going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Taking that individual accountability and responsibility. So anything's possible. Anything's possible yeah. uh, for, for them to do as far as, you know, uh, false flag, a psycho psycho psychological operation or a full on, you know, blood ritual. Yeah. So, I mean, it's I preparedness and propagation preparedness, meaning you're ready for whatever, whenever, at all times and propagation, you're propagation, propagating the problem, the, the causal factors, the root of the problem. And how can we create change? Right. S staying in there, because when you're prepared, not living in fear, you're in a place of love because you're, you're ready physically, mentally, uh, emotionally, you're ready for whatever. And then you're propagating, meaning you're activated and you're, you're taking you're taking action in this reality towards creating change. That's an act of love. Remember, self-defense is an act of love, oh, 100%. Yeah. You know, yeah, this is uh, bringing up a lot of interesting points for me. Um, first of all, quickly to touch on how people want to believe that they live in a bubble, that they're insulated from these greater events. Like, oh, well, yeah, that sucks and all, but, you know, what has that got to do with me, right? This is all circling back to the disconnect with nature. And again, I feel like I always have to say this. When we talk about nature, we aren't just talking about birds and trees and animals and the sun and the flowers and all this kind of stuff. We're talking mm -hmm. about the unified reality field that we all live within as a, a singular ecosystem. Think about ecosystem. That's what nature is. Each being within that as a sovereign individual, but that is part of the whole and also having influence on everything else around it. That is the key factor right here. So it's like when we're talking about this great work, it's because even if we never get directly stomped on by the state in some, you know, like overt direct way, we're doing what we feel is right based on the our world, the state of our world, our earth. It's all of ours. It is our birthright, but we share it. It's not mine or yours. It's ours. And what we do with it is makes all the difference because the earth will be just fine without us. In fact, probably a lot better off without us. But we can either destroy it or we could be conscious stewards that can help maintain ecosystems even better than totally, you know, natural dynamics within that. For, for example, right, uh, we could help with uh, overpopulation of certain things that are being that are, uh, you know, destroying an ecosystem and, and the, the life within it, for example. Right. Some might say that's wrong, but I mean. You know, it's like what's worse, not doing anything and just allowing that to happen or is a little bit of relativism in there where you might destroy some life here to, to save a lot more life over here. It's a net positive, right? Mm -hmm. These are kind of things that people don't want to get into, even especially within our very black and white. It's all objective. It's all black. You know, it's, it just is how it is. And that's not how nature actually works. Nature is yeah. a spectrum, right? There is, you know, think about a spectrum. There is a black and a white way over here, but everything else in the middle is is uh, gray. So the black and white do exist. There is very clean cut examples of good and evil, but then there's a lot of in between, and it's up us to up to us to exercise our own intelligence, and that's what people don't want to do. They want to be told how to live. They want to give me the instruction man manual. Mm. Give me the Bible. Give me the Ten Commandments. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yes, sir. No, sir. Right. Instead of using your own God-given conscience, right? Yes. Discerning. It's not that you decide what's right and wrong. It's that you discern to the best of your abilities. And every situation is different. And sometimes there is no right choice and wrong choice. It's two kind of different choices with pros and cons and you got to just kind of do your best it's not always going to be that easy and, and simple and that's that's what people are so afraid of they don't want that responsibility 
you know? Um, That's right. I, I, I digressed a bit. I was going to say something else too, but um, kind of forgetting right now. What, what were that we talking fire. about before I started? Because I circled back to the the great um, work stuff, but you were talking about... We were, um, we were touching on the season of sacrifice. Um, one great work, the internal work. Um, oh, oh, um, the solar eclipse. Yeah, I think it was just the season of sacrifice thing of like, yeah, th the answer is always the same. It doesn't matter whether there's some event coming, whether you know about it or not. The problem is still the problem. Mm -hmm. State is going to state. Yep. You got it. The answer is the same state. day to day. <laughs> so you, you just come come with that. You live in that. Like you said yourself, Will, doing the work, bringing the offering the solution and uh, and then I had this idea of like, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, man. Do you think that the belief in authority gives more power to the the dark occultist? Now, like what I mean by I mean, that sounds obvious on its face. But what I mean is the dark occultists aren't really the ones that are in government necessarily. They're controlling it. Right. But even if we lived in an anarchistic society where there was no state apparatus, they could probably still find a way to network, to organize and to carry out events such as false flags and things like that and still manipulate people. But how much is really my question? Of course, it plays some effect. But to you, Will, how much do you think it makes it easier for them um, to do these particular kind of events and manipulation on that on that mass kind of mind control scale because the state exists. Fantastic. That's a fantastic concept and question. Um, and in in my opinion, I think government, the belief in human authority, is one of many platforms or religions that they can utilize. We've yeah. seen this in history through really through religion and kingship. And sure, you could say that was government, but not the government we have now. That was more of a religious, you know, the divine right to rule yeah. the king or the queen through their blood and their genetics. They speak to God creator. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it was more of a religious control control it's, structure. Yeah. And then, you the know, government they, was an extension of religion. The government was secondary, whereas like right. the religion was just the uh, executive branch of God. Right. Yes. That's yeah. why the divine right to rule and all that. And it's interesting. And, and you know, kind of operating in twos, meaning your primary and your secondary, which your secondary is kind of a fallback. So when the awareness starts to increase, then you can bring your secondary up and, you know, problem, reaction, solution, you know, uh, divine right to rule, kingship, that kind of stuff it fades out and then democracy fades in, you know, classical government like we have now and sure there's still kings and queenships in some areas but um it, it has changed from what it you know was 1500s 1400s 1600s etc um so yeah but really it's the real apparatus and tool is the knowledge of nature the knowledge of mentalism polarity with energy um and that is having that toolkit you can do whatever you, you can infiltrate at any time as long as ignorance is there right because that's the breeding ground for evil for control for slavery right it's and as that long as that environment is there exactly you can the 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 dark seeds the infectious virus can can plant at any time so yeah. um you know i i like to war game um, and I've done this for many years using the imagination and uh, imagining alternative scenarios. You know, what would life look like without government? What if there was a global catastrophe and the whole grid shut down? And I play that out in my in my mind. Right. And it's it's kind of a learning process. It's something that's part of my visual thinking. Well, but the new age would tell you you're manifesting it because you're, yeah. you're focusing on the negative. Right. You're creating exactly. that. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Don't think about that, bro. 
It's going to come true. <laughs> Don't say it. It's going to come true. It's going to manifest. But, um, but yeah, wargaming these potentialities. But really, I do it to just to see the insight and, and what I can learn from that potential scenario. And I'll give you an example. Let's just say right we're wargaming here let's just say the whole grid goes down and you know communications are shot the one great work does not end right i mean it would just include like literally probably horseback riding going to village to village educating people on moral principles and natural law because even then the social engineers cuz obviously they they have that force and that monopoly of order followers, right? So it's all they have they have a large influence at all times. Doesn't matter if the grid goes down or not. You know, they're going around to town, village, city to city, propagating whatever they want. Um, still that education does not stop. It still continues. So mm -hmm. my point being that it's it's always in the garden of the mind. Like you were talking about in the interview at the end, right? Uh, and just recently talking about being a stewardship, a gardener of this planet where, yeah, those dandelions are magic, medicinal, and you maybe you keep some, but they're invasive. And if you're growing your vegetables, you don't want your dandelions to suck the nutrients out of whatever section of your, you know, your beans or corn or whatever. So you need to pull them. So there is this symbiosis, there is this balance, homeostasis, just like mm -hmm. you were saying. Nature is always trying to find homeostasis, that middle mm -hmm. balance, which can it almost represents the serpent, the kundalini serpent going up the middle path. Right. It's not a straight line. It is a it's weaving, but weaving. it's tight. Yes. It's not to an extreme pol polarized side. And that's just part of the human experience. Wow, that's it's part like of that. this this reality. It's like that sine wave dancing with truth all the way up. Dude, 100%, man. 100%. That's nice. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I love this, man. I mean, the uh yeah, the stewardship. That's it, because because nature has its own kind of intelligence, but it's not the same as we have, right? Nature doesn't know what homeostasis means. It just instinctually is, is searching for it. But human beings can observe a, a dynamic playing out and say, that's imbalanced. And, and then through that, you know, your responsibility is your ability to respond. So when you see something like that happening naturally, then you can um, inter, uh, intervene and steer that in, in one direction towards what you believe to be a, a more harmonic state. And maybe you don't get it right 100%, but again, nature doesn't get it right 100%, right? There's deformities. There's I mean, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in nature. Like you said, a, a total overgrowth of an invasive species. Mm -hmm. You know, this, um, nature is not perfect. This is a, a fallacy that people kind of project on that might have been one of my favorite things we we uh, that well that came through my mind during that interview was that realization of the dialectic between people that think humans are the problem and we're nasty, vile, horrible, like a virus on the planet, and the and nature's all just perfect and harmony and all the animals and this and that, or vice versa, right? Nature's yeah. pure chaos and and just suffering and all this stuff, and human beings are you know, God's gift to nature to, to like bring order and, and build trick technology and cities and scientific advancements to, to counter the chaos of nature, you know, through medicine and things like that. And man, yeah, dude. And we like, where does that come from? This is what religion propagates that human beings are the apex of creation on earth. And then you have God right so th that separation is always propagated and uh and I, I agree with you we need worldview healing 100 percent. yes there's there's one thing you can consider perfect and that is the law natural law you can guarantee it's going it's it's in effect and it is always affecting it's always responding 
effective. Man, but man, if, yeah, manifested nature, there's all these different variables and factors. So yeah, you know, defects, anomalies come up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, that's kind of the, the, the nature of this, this re this universe, this school that we're in all together, co-creating it. Yeah. That word always stands out to me. Anomaly. I, anomaly, I find that concept yeah. to be so interesting, right? It's, it's a word that we came up with to explain the unexplainable, right? Oh, well, it's just an anomaly, right? It, yeah. Yes. What it is, is it's, <laughs> it's an, it's an outlier, right? It's something that, that lands outside of the boundaries of typical or probabilities, but it's often used as kind of a cop out of like, yes. we understand this perfectly. Well, what about this? Oh, that, that, that's just an anomaly. Don't worry about that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. th there's nothing is over a hundred percent. Other than, you know, maybe natural law itself. But the point is natural law is it, it interacts with the variables. Yes. And the variables are always different. You never know. And that anomaly, that outlier is always caused by some unforeseen variable that threw the, the whole d dynamic for a loop. You know what I mean? Yeah. 100%. As you were talking about anomaly and I had to look up the etymology and uh, let's see unevenness, a deviation from common rule. So it comes from the Latin or actually Greek anomalia, uneven, irregular. Right, right. Yep. But yeah, for sure. And you were talking about, you know, effects right um natural law is an effect and then it, it triggered this memory of of what do people say when they're being very authoritative and they make some just arbitrary law effective immediately they're playing god by saying like i just created a law and it's effective immediately right yeah. effective e effective right yes. god yep for Interesting. sure man <laughs> yeah that's it's fascinating i love it this comment right here, the problem is the bad programming, not the people. People want to be good, at least most of them. Uh, that is true. Yeah, no, I I, th I think I would say the majority of people, right, except for the anomalies of, you know, the individuals that, you know, are kind of born that first degree psychopath, meaning the hardware, there's a dysfunction in, in the brain mm -hmm. uh, from birth. So they don't, they don't actually have the capacity um, then, but yeah, the majority of people actually want to be good and actually think they are a good person, which is kind of part of the, you know, part of the, the delusion as well, because I don't think a lot of people actually apply introspection on what it means to be a good person. What even They're, is good? That's yes. what was standing out to me is they, how can you think that you're good if you don't even know what good means or what it looks like when you see it? It's, yeah. it's, it's, if it's a relative term, then you could just do whatever and convince yourself, oh, I, I'm good. I'm the good guy, right? Because whatever I say is good is good. Of course, that's, you know, that's easy, you know? Yep. But yeah. it, it's funny because, yeah, like you watch movies and it's all like very obvious that here's the good guy, here's the bad guy, and you're rooting for the good guy. Most movies are built that way. Very, you know, very few are the kind of the other way around where, and I always kind of enjoy those movies where there are really no good guys and bad guys. Everybody's kind of just like they do some good things, but they're kind of gritty and it's all this just kind of power play stuff or whatever. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's weird when you think about that, like we are programmed with this, like, I want to be the good guy programming from like Disney movies and all this kind of stuff from a young age. But then most people aren't actually living the life of a good person, um, at least not not fully. It's very uh, schizophrenic kind of. I mean, it's it's definitely nuanced. Right. I don't think. People, most people are necessarily good or bad. Uh, they're kind of a bit of both. They're kind of a paradox because that's 
that's what programming does. You've mm -hmm. got all these, that's what cognitive dissonance is. It's literally conflicting ideas living in your head, like bouncing off of each other and causing friction and, you know. Yeah, discord. exactly. Yep. And, and m movies, right? To move motion picture to move someone mm. um it you know it speaks to the subconscious mind this is why you know people can easily recognize you know the matrix movie and root for root for the morality in these movies root for the one that's fighting against tyranny and duress and violence and it's easy for people to do that right that resonates in their subconscious subconscious mind in their heart Right. But then mm. the disconnect obviously is applying it to themselves and to the world, which I that to me right there is sorcery. That is what that's the effect right. of sorcery uh, and cognitive dissonance, of course. Right. Um, like, think about it. if it's which one's easier to convince a, a person to be, be bad or to distort what they think is good and skew it off to your the direction that you you like right so it's it's their discernment ability you know what i mean yep it's like they they yes. don't recognize evil when they actually see it any person will tell you oh yeah slavery is terrible but then they'll go and vote it's like oh but that that's not slavery though right i'm against slavery but that's not what that is and so therefore that's okay that is that's it right there and what is the definition of discernment? To to distinguish between two things. I mean, oh, is it? It's value and judgment. Discernment. Is, well, judgment is discernment plus value. I, right. I was yeah. That's what I was looking for, and yes. I, I I know you've talked about this, so I was yeah. kind of trying to t ball one up. But that's perfect. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that. That's what discernment is. Just, oh, well, this is red and this is blue, right? Yes. Those are two different things. But red is good. Blue is bad, which obviously colors are are neutral. But the point being like knowing and having those value uh, judgments assigned to distinguishing between two things, right? Yes. And this is I think this is what a lot of people lack too. they values. And I, I, I think when people think of values, they think of more cultural uh, or even traditions, what they value. Um, values need to be more down to that spiritual level, you know, based in morality, the, the, the value, value. Of, of truth. And this all stems from the disconnect of like the <laughs> philosophical mind or the higher order <laughs> thinking of a human being. What makes a human being a human being? I mean, one aspect and that that deep thinking i mean you and i are very similar in how we kind of operate throughout the day and that this is a very animistic uh, characteristic where we're reading between the lines of everything we're seeing the symbolism the correlations the correspondences just naturally we we, we can pick up on that kind of stuff and um and people just don't don't think about that kind of stuff and this is this is where a lot of the damage comes. Um, it, it, it's almost like a muscle. You have to, you kind of have to practice it in the beginning. And this is why starting at your zero point of de deprogramming yourself is so vital. And someone said, um, I think, was it this one? It's their deep seated beliefs in their religion that holds humanity back. Absolutely. That's where that deprogramming needs to come in. They're attached to their beliefs and to their religion and that is all encompassing on how they operate mm. in reality day to day their values don't come from their own experience they're instilled upon them through religion like like yep. they just said and um that that is part of the problem it, it doesn't come from a place of understanding why is this a value why is this valuable? Another thing that really irks me when I hear it is people insist time and time again that value is subjective. All that value is subjective. Like, you know, what I like might not be what you like. That That is only a one piece of the, you know, it's a half truth. There is a subjective component to value, right? There's preferences 
and opinions and things, but there are also objective values. And you never hear people talk about that. Or when you do, it it's usually coming from some kind of like religious framework, which we were just talking about this yesterday, I believe, or in our uh, mastermind, mm -hmm. where that that's the dialectic of like morality. It's either total relativism or it's coming from a false uh, dogmatic framework. Right. And those are both not coming from a place of true gnosis. But, you know, things like honesty, truth, health, these are not subjective values. And, and the irony is, well, what about people that smoke? They don't care about their health. It's, it's not valuable to them. Wait till they get sick. Yes see if they're e either they'll change their mind and realize, Oh, I actually did care about my health. I was just being stupid or I don't even care if I die, you know, bring it on. I don't like being here anyway. That person is sick in the mind. That's what mental illness is, is deviation from truth. So you can't sit here and say, Oh, well, because some people deviate from truth, then, then like that, that truth is, doesn't apply to them. That's not how this works. Exactly. It's it's kind of, you know, tricky to explain this. It's a little bit subtle and nuanced, but hopefully I'm making sense with that. Yeah, no, you, you touched on you touched on great points, man. I mean, even the etymology of value, it's talking about moral worth. Mm. Moral worth is the etymology. Yeah. And derived and then it derived from strength. So value equals, right? What the equals, it's the why. And, you know, real knowledge versus information, there is a difference. You have information, the raw uh, data, and then you right. have knowledge. Knowledge is something that can be used. And for you to have knowledge, you need to understand the why of something. If you understand the why, then you have gnosis, you have knowledge, and it can be it, it's real world and applicable information. Right. Yeah. The difference between knowledge and information, in my opinion, is that knowledge is based in reality, whereas yes. information might not be. Like if I lie to you, I just gave you some information, mm -hmm. but it's not knowledge because if it's, if it's not true. And then to, the next step would be understanding of not just knowing that it's true, but you you know why it's true. And you you understand where in the, the big picture does this fit into the framework of natural law, essentially. Yep. 100 percent, man. I mean, that's what ignorance is, is the absence of truth. Right. What is what is knowledge? Knowledge is. Having. Partial. Um information based in truth understanding is knowing the why of the fragments of truth and then wisdom is the application of truth right yes so and, 100 percent and, and anything else is just conceptual it's just artificial it's a mental co construct it's just a an abstract thought form right exactly and in this idea of truth and honesty uh, I love coming back to the, like, it's just such a uh, useful way of looking at it for me because we're, you and I were constantly dealing with solipsists of all kinds, whether they're atheistic or, or new agey, like it's all, it's all over the place. Right. But it's like, and then taking it back to this conversation that we're having about oh, value subjective. So there's, there's no objective value in honesty, right? That's what they're saying, right? If mm -hmm. this is a blanket statement, then there's no sub, you know, though, there's no true objective universal value in honesty. Uh, well, wait till somebody lies to you and see how you like it. And then maybe, you know, but then it's like, well, that's, that's just them, right? There's the solipsistic thing again of just like, well, it's, it's what's good for me versus, you know, it's not just universal or they'll try to point out, well, you know, would you lie to a robber about, where your family is or where your money is or whatever. And the, like, as if that somehow negates it, like the whole point is using your intelligence. Are you telling me you can't tell the difference between lying to your partner about like infidelity and lying to a robber about keep, keeping your family safe? 
you 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 really can't tell the difference between you're going to just put that all in the same basket and be like well you know one's good one's bad so you can't really say like lying's bad you know what i mean it's like yeah. here just here's the here's the trash can put your brain in here because you you obviously don't need it yeah it, you know yeah. <laughs> exactly. you don't want it <laughs> exactly and this is this is the problem with the religion of relativism and uh, their relativism does exist but it's the way that most people have subscribed to it it is a religion meaning they it, it's a worldview they think reality is relative so that means you know there is no right or wrong mm -hmm. lying good or bad harm it's all relative to one's own experience and this is the problem it's it's having a sliver and turning it on its head right yes reality functions objectively and we are in that objective reality having our subjective relative experience you can't conflate the two one doesn't go over the other right it's so somebody needs to understand that where they're coming from when as soon as you as soon as relativism becomes that overarching worldview all communication goes out the window you can't communicate with anyone mm -hmm. and that's a great example of something like values yeah, and when I've talked about how if you really don't believe in truth, then there's nothing you can say or whatsoever that doesn't conflict with that. Because there's there's two things that you can do with your voice. You can either make a statement, which is a declaration of truth, or ask a question, which implies that you want a truthful answer. Otherwise, what difference does it make? Why would you even answer? you know, ask the question to begin with if you don't care what the answer is or whether it's true or not. So both of those imply that there is such a thing as truth. That's what irks me with, with these people that believe this is just like, you don't actually believe that. Yeah. It's just this soundbite that you picked up and you think it makes you sound super cool and spiritual and, you, you know, truth, like whose truth are we talking about here? <laughs> yeah. It, it, so again, it, like ask them right then and there. So you're saying there's no such thing as a liar. There's no such thing as a liar. Everything politicians say is, is just fine, right? They never lie. It's all relative. So it's true to them, right? Like yep. you don't believe that. No one is that brain dead. Come on now. Yep, it, exactly. It, it's just a, it's a program that just comes out. It's on autoplay, right? And they, they don't just spew it without even it. thinking about it or understanding what the fuck they're saying or what they're implying beyond what the words that they're saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's that. There's that funny video. I can't remember who, who it was by. It, it might have been, uh, it might have been Matt Walsh when he was, was in, that, that. in that documentary when he's having yeah. that conversation with that relativist, and he was like, "Well, do I exist right now? Am I talking to you?" And she goes. Uh, I don't know. Are you? Yeah. And she, he's like, uh, but I'm right in front of you having a conversation with you. You're saying I don't exist. She's like, well, you do in my reality, but I don't know if, if you do in your reality. It was something like that. It was just like, oh my gosh, this is the disconnect of, of nature, of self. Right. And um, it, it is dis-ease, disease. This yes. is what it is. And it's total narcissism if you think about it too. Absolutely. And everything in your world is all about you. It all comes from your mind. Just That's... imagine imagine this, as Mark likes to say. Imagine this. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. Good one. Good one. <laughs> And that's narcissism right there. It's the it's the abdication of personal responsibility. Just like government. Yep. Right. Government does the same thing. It's it's one of the biggest narcissists, which, again, government is not an entity. It's human beings with right. a belief system. So that's where effective it, immediately, eff effective <laughs> immediately. Yeah, man. Dude. Crazy. Mm. Good stuff. Have you ever seen circumcision? Uh, Logan actually did. Uh, you, you did a video on this, right? I played it in the, you were on that video. We did the, um, what men must endure That's on my right. live show, um, last year. And I, I showed, I showed the video. It actually got a strike on Facebook for that, but mm. no regrets. Yep. People but, need to you know, see that. 
right along the lines of just you know religious dogma the, the mutilation of a, a young baby the most young yeah baby. pure innocent thing it's, it's wild that it's like you show that to somebody and they're like oh, i don't want to see that sure you know it makes you feel ill just even seeing that imagine being that child you know if yeah. you don't even want to look at it in a video yep <laughs> And I mean, in, in my, in my opinion, I think something like circumcision, it, it's one of the most traumatic experiences that you can do to a being that early. Yeah. Um, and it, because how socially acceptable, like it, normalized. exactly, it's exactly. Wild. It's so, so fresh from birth when that child needs mother 100% right after birth. I mean, yeah, father is there too, but the already being, you know, nine months connected to the mother and still connected to the mother, then that is happened on the, the, the unconscious level, energetic level. It's, it's an ultimate betrayal. And I think that has, um, just dire effects. Uh, it, I mean, deep within the, the, uh, the unconscious mind. Um, totally. so yeah, for sure. RIP our foreskins. RIP. Damn. Miss missing out. <laughs> missing out <laughs> I mean, yeah sex is still cool and all but i can just only imagine what i'm what i'm missing you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah if anybody has any questions uh in the chat go ahead and uh and and put those in there we are stream, um streaming on instagram the instagram uh chat isn't integrated into my streaming software so i have to manually go over there and look at it hmm. Yeah. Uh, let us know, you know, what did you think about this, um, this interview specifically what we talked about in the, uh, in the live stream in the, uh, the, the chat with Rick. Um, I'd love to hear you guys thoughts on kind of our take on holiday of Easter and the season of sacrifice and just the, you know, getting into the animistic mindset, that 100%. severance, the severance of nature absolutely and you know it's good there, there was a lot of emphasis uh logan touched on some really good points in the interview about this time period the season of sacrifice uh it it's it's not all doom and gloom right it's about your soil in the mind right. and what you are doing right now and activating and yeah. planting those seeds within yourself on the mental level um, and I, I think that's that's really important for people to, to understand because there's so much, oh, April 8th, the eclipse, there's all this kind of stuff, which I'm not ne negating that. Yeah, sure, that could be a possibility, but it's so victim y. It, it is very, it is very victim y, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and if it is happening, that's something that's out of your control. So, you know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, that is the empowered mindset right there. I'm glad that you touched on that because it's not their fucking holiday. They might think that they've hijacked it, but it's just like I talked about earlier. It's all of our earth. It's all of our reality. It's, it's all of our planting season, right? That, exactly. Dude, make the most of it. Use that charge. Just like they are plant your own seeds of, of abundance and prosperity. You can do that. Nothing. No one's stopping you. Yep, one hundred percent, man. One hundred percent. And you know, I think uh, I think something like the awareness of the the animistic mindset um, in my upcoming presentation. I'm going to be diving into evolutionary animism, talking about what it is and how this can move us forward to an evolutionary. Uh, state of mind and action in the world towards towards true freedom. A lot of people think when you say something like e even like the, talking about the Native Americans or you know pagans or animism, it's almost an automatic. And again, this is a conditioned response to revert to the past or looking at the condition of the world. Oh, we need to go back to you know constitutional government. We need to go back to uh, all these ways. And number one, there is no going back. There's only learning from the past and there's going forward. So 
applying that information that we have learned from the past and focused on the future. Well said. I'm excited for that one, man. Is that this week? Uh, next Wednesday. So April next 3rd. Yep. Sweet. Yeah, it's going to be great. Again, uh, people can uh, jump on, watch my presentation, and then I do a live open discussion. Logan's been joining me for those as well. It's awesome. Anyone's invited. You can do just audio if you want, or you can do video. The links will be on my website, willkeller.com. So it, it's going to be good. I'm going to be tying in uh, a lot of stuff from the first presentation. And um, it, it's really all one presentation, but instead of, you know, six hours, I cut it up into two pieces. Um, so yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be great. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Let me go up to these. We had a few other questions. It's a very sweet comment, uh, chief. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. I saw that. That's awesome. It's a cool profile picture too. Predator. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's right. Let's see what, what is, if what is happening on the eclipse? Um, I, Reiki, maybe you can um, rewrite that question. I'm not understanding. Oh, if, if what is happening on the eclipse, you mean potentialities of, of what could be going down? Um, I'm not too sure. Uh, just what the available information, it's all hearsay that's out there, right? Is the National Guard's been preparing for two years. There's been sheriffs uh in the the mid-america states that have been preparing for um for two years for this e eclipse um i've had some uh astrologers talk about there could be a potential earthquake just where um i think it was jupiter and uranus their placements and that was potentially around the 20th of april um you know again it, it's we're, we're talking about the realm of effects, the, the manifested realm. So who knows? Who knows? But going back to what Logan and I were saying, you know, being prepared, ready for whatever, and not letting that affect you um, in your mentation. Yeah. I got a question for you, Will. Yeah. What do you think would, what, what is your take on like the pagan or animistic perspective on an eclipse? What, you know, allegorically? Yeah. Right, the the blacking out of the sun briefly in the middle of the day. It's pretty interesting. Good one. This question came up on the Instagram chat uh, earlier on in our interview, <clears throat> and um, you know, there's there's cultures in the past, uh, like in the Vedic system, right, where there was a secondary sun. Even in the the Oriental um, uh, traditions, there was the black sun. Uh, this invisible to the human eye second sun that our system was a binary system and in the vedic system it was rahu right rahu and ketu rahu was actually the one that's eclipsing the sun and that's the only time we see it that's the the outline of it uh versus the the actual the physical moon um and that you know it represents the the unconscious mind uh the collective unconscious or, or the individual but um and then in the orientals uh we see a lot of the artwork where um there's the figure that is eating um the sun but the eating of the sun is the black sun itself so uh it that that's a that's a good question um but the what the eclipse how what we know of it the the moon um and the sun interacting um i i think it's it's a positive time of alignment and unification hmm, that's um it, a good it, point. i find it interesting that they sell these these you know light these sun blocker uh glasses everywhere and you know millions of people are going to be out there looking at the eclipse and you know probably you know 99.9 percent .9 of people have their eyes covered 
um, when, you know, I mean, sun gazing is absolutely a beneficial um, uh, practice. Of course, you can burn your eyes if it's high noon and you're staring at the sun. But I think there's a, a transference of energy. Um, so hmm. it's been it's been noted in uh, Native American cultures that it, it is a portal as well for for spirits to pass through and it was uh it was celebrated you know it was celebrated and it was looked on as kind of a uh you know a negative prophecy time it yeah it was all the, the imagery of like apocalypto you remember oh yes the sacrifices yeah. very interesting actually considering what's going on right now season of sacrifice and an eclipse Almost wonder if that's all pointing to something like what people are talking about right now. I mean, shit. Mel Gibson probably knows a thing or thing or two about a thing or two. But anyway, yep. yeah, it is interesting. I like what you said about alignment because that that does resonate. You know, the the alignment of the the soul with the mind. Right. Yes. That's what that is. The sun and the moon is the soul and the mind as one. I like that. Uh, Reiki. Uh, in, in on Instagram said that she said, or or he sorry. Um, I heard that to the ancients it occurred slash influence changes of power and the falling of rulers a changeover. Mm. That that's what what she states. It, it could be even something in the middle as well. What it represents. Uh, I mean, I, I think the I think the period that we're in, you know. It, multiple years is a transitional period of consciousness we're officially in that new age of aquarius the energies are changing um and i think the social engineers know this so that could be a positive symbol uh in the natural world of just the energies are shifting and this is one of the reasons why the social engineers want to throw all these excuse me, all these dialectics and psyops over it and rituals over it to distract the energies coming in or the energies that could be aligned with. So I think it could be something in, in the middle. Yeah, or, or it could just be neutral. Like like we talked about, it is what it is, but yeah. uh, it can kind of go either way. It's an event that has a charge and can be transmuted and utilized Yep. As the uh, as the magician sees fit. Yeah, I, I've seen also it representing uh, the dark night of the soul, which means mm. um, or the dark day of the soul. <laughs> kind of like what uh, Reiki was saying. Yeah, dark day of the soul. Exactly. Eclipsing the sun, um, representing the soul as well. So it's kind of like the the dark dark night, dark day of the soul for, for the the reality for reality itself, the planet and everything a shifting. Um, and you know, we're all connected to nature. So I think humanity in the aggregate, in the collective being in opposition to nature, having that extreme polarity. Uh, I do think, I mean, the planet being a living conscious being and the, as us, the stewards and part of this, this biosphere being in opposition, there could be immune response, right? It could be we're such in the negative polarization that there has to be a force for forceful uh, balance. And that could come in the form of earthquakes, volcanoes, whatever. Um, but still, like Logan said, right, it, the, the, the problem, the root of the problem still does not change, right? Understanding natural law, morality, understanding that there are uh, this parasite class and through our unconscious consent, we are propagating the system. Yeah. Yep. I was just thinking, where's Estradni when you need him? I'm sure he'd have some good stuff to say about the, the eclipse. Oh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. So, yep. What's up, uh, Zerilath? What's going on, man? Yeah, what's up, brother? Steven. Charlie said, yeah, he just watched Apocalypto last night. I'm curious, did you do that because of the eclipse, or was that just kind of a coincidence? No such thing as coincidence, right, Will? That was a good, that was a good flick. Really? Yeah. 
it's really cool. Yeah, it was it was really a good one. Savage. I always thought holidays were fun. It is contributing to wrongdoing in some esoteric way to celebrate holidays. No, we we talked about that in the episode um, that you know as long as you have awareness of the roots and what is the true meaning of the season and how you're using that, participating in the you know traditions is. I'd say pretty harmless as long as you know what it is and you're doing so from that place of, of knowing gnosis and just for fun, right? Not, not lying to children about Easter bunnies or Santa Claus or whatever it may be. Right. But if it's all in good fun, I see no issue with it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you can see what, what culture wants people to do, right? I mean, it's crazy. I, I walk into the grocery store and it, I mean, they just go from one holiday to the next and there's always like four or five aisles. It's all shit, candy, shit, food. And, you know, people feel obligated that they need to give a basket of poison of chemicals to their kids. Yeah. So now you're, I mean, you are participating in the facade of what the holiday should be about. And, you know, people are, are propagating this to their kids, but yet yeah, I, I agree with you, Logan, for sure. And, you know, these holidays, that mindset of the, the fantasy uh, Santa Claus and this kind of stuff, it really does set the stage for the belief in government or the belief in, you know, um, extreme religion. planning a trip upstate near totality excellent Zerlath, what do you think about the eclipse man you got any thoughts or anyone got any thoughts any more thoughts on the eclipse coming up what about the bridge in baltimore that just happened what do you guys think uh i, I don't know much about you know whatever reports of what they're saying on the news or anything like that i just i saw it on social media saw that it happened saw some pictures and videos um like an hour after it happened um it was early in the morning um so i haven't done any of the the deep diving you know I, i'm personally i'm out of that phase um not saying that i I necessarily won't go back into that. And what I'm talking about is an event happens and, oh, shit, I got to find all the alternative meanings of it. I need to do the dramatria to, for the numbers and all this kind of stuff. It's like to, to find what? That it was a, a ritual? Well, I already know that they do this shit this, this time of year. It's like so it's getting it's getting away from you know, focusing and spending my energy, investing my energy on the effects and, and still focusing on, on cause and solutions. So it's tragic whenever somebody lose, whenever there's a loss of life, that's tragic. What's going on in, you know, in the, the Middle East, it's tragic. It's tragic. But guess what? Unfortunately, this type of shit has been going on for years and years and years there's always a war going on there's always death and destruction and there's a reason why it is continuous and always happens it's this is not a new phenomena yeah you always have to ask yourself especially when you're pouring this much energy into something like what what are you hoping to achieve with that is it really worth it you know <clears throat> yeah Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate you. So I thought it was obvious, but I was just wondering what you guys thought. I agree with all that, Will. Right on. Yep. Yeah, you know, what it really comes down to, it really comes down to keep people distracted from understanding natural law objective morality and the belief in human authority that's yep. that's what it all comes down to if because when people have that level of awareness and they understand the roots of the tree of evil and and the the lack of personal responsibility from people uh now now you're down to the root of the problem you're down to the cause and they don't want people to a recognize that and then understand how to create change and how to remedy that issue, which is speaking out, 
learning the, the tools of technology, getting a message out there, influencing others uh, in awareness of the, the, the problem. And, uh, you know, everything they do, it's all surrounded by that, that right yeah. there, that distraction. And a siphoning of energy. Oh, well, yep, 100%. You know? And it's like there's the, the, what their sacrifice in and of itself. Now there's this whole um, bustling activity from the truth or community to, to go, oh, there's a new thing. Let's go and just, you know, de deconstruct it all and make a million TikToks videos and like nothing changes, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, this is part of doing the one great work is trying to get, um, I, I mean, I, I think the potentiality is there um in the truth and freedom movement but still that internal work for individuals is just so lacking um there's a lot of people that have an awareness of what's going on right now now that doesn't necessarily mean they're down to the causal factors of the problem but they have they un they have recognized a problem and that is the first step um so that is potentiality but is it going to actualize from there is a totally different, uh, you know, different subject. And that is going to take care, willpower and and correct knowledge. Gnosis. Yup. Excellent. Excellent. What you think, Will? Just yeah. crossed the three hour mark. That's right. Excellent. Yeah, let's. uh. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. Um, man, we've had a lot of people in here watching this live show, this stream. It was kind of sporadic, but I love it. I love coming on here. I love chatting with you, Logan. You always bring uh, incredible value to the table and insight. And uh, the engagement from the audience is great. A lot of great comments in there. I love seeing it. So thank you all for uh, that tuned in. And uh, Logan, go ahead and shout out your uh, your platforms for me. Sure. Yeah. Anyone want to uh, look into my work, check out the wizardfactory.com. Everything is there. All my social media links and YouTube platform is right there at the top. And uh, just just look around. There's, there's a ton of stuff there. Absolutely. Right on. Um, again, reminder, I'm going to do a big post with the title card and all that good stuff. Wednesday, April 3rd, 6 p.m., Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. I'm doing the part two of my live presentation, Spirituality, Remember and Reunite. This will be a continuation of part one um, that definitely need to check out for part two. It's a continuation again, um, and I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to have a, a good response and, and offer some great value. So if anyone else wants to check out uh, my work, check me out at willkeller.com. Do it. And it and do it. Do it. <laughs> Excellent. All right, brother. You enjoy your night and all the viewers uh, Bye, out there. Guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. This was fun chat. Absolutely. We'll see you next time. Peace.